an interview with author Salman Rushdie. And now, a House hearing on complaints about formaldehyde fumes in FEMA hurricane relief trailers. FEMA has received hundreds of such complaints, and Wednesday, the agency asked the Centers for Disease Control to help to test the air quality in its trailers. Henry Waxman chairs the Oversight and Government Reform Committee about how FEMA handled the complaints. This is four hours, five minutes. Meeting of the committee will all please come to order. <clears throat> Today we begin two days of hearings on the Federal Emergency Management Agency. These hearings are part of a series of hearings in this committee on how to make government effective again. In the 1990s, FEMA was a model government agency. But as Hurricane Katrina showed, cronyism, underfunding, and lack of leadership turned FEMA into the most ridiculed agency in the government. In these hearings, we will ask whether FEMA has learned the lessons of Hurricane Katrina and restored its capacity to protect the public in disasters. Today we are going to look at a narrow but telling subject, FEMA trailers that exposed our citizens to dangerous levels of formaldehyde. Then in two weeks, we will look at the broader topic of FEMA's preparedness for the next disaster. And I want to commend uh, my, our colleague, Ranking Member Tom Davis, for asking for the preparedness hearing and for his bipartisan approach to these issues. Americans were repulsed by the indifference and incompetence of FEMA displayed after Hurricane Katrina. Incredibly, FEMA has adopted the same attitude in addressing reports of high levels of formaldehyde in FEMA trailers. The nearly 5,000 pages of documents we have reviewed expose an official policy of premeditated ignorance. Senior FEMA officials in Washington didn't want to know what they already knew because they didn't want the moral and legal responsi responsibility to do what they knew had to be done. So they did their best not to know. It's sickening and the exact opposite of what government should be. My staff has prepared a a briefing memo for members that describes in detail what we learned from our review of the FEMA documents. And I ask unanimous consent to include the memo and the documents at sites in the hearing record. Without objection, that will be the order. The FEMA documents depict a battle between FEMA field staff who recognized right away that formaldehyde was a serious problem and FEMA headquarters, particularly FEMA's lawyers, who wanted to pretend it didn't exist. In March 2006, news articles reported high levels of formaldehyde in FEMA trailers. FEMA st field staff urged immediate action, saying, quote, this needs to be fixed today. We need to take a proactive approach. And there is, quote, immediate need for a plan of action. But when the issue reached FEMA lawyers, they blocked testing of occupied trailers. One FEMA attorney explained, quote, do not initiate any testing until we give the OK. Once you get results, the clock is running on our duty to respond to them, end quote. Another FEMA official wrote the Office of General Counsel has advised, quote, we do not do testing because it would imply FEMA's ownership of this issue. Early in the process, due to the perseverance of a pregnant mother with a four-month-old child, FEMA did test one occupied trailer. The results showed that their trailer had formaldehyde levels 75 times higher than the maximum workplace exposure levels recommended by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Well, the mother evacuated the trailer. FEMA then stopped test test testing other trailers, and top officials issued a statement that said, quote, FEMA and industry experts have evaluated the small number of cases 
where odors of formaldehyde have been reported, and we are confident there is no ongoing risk. That's where they said after they stopped testing the trailers. Well, in early, early July 2006, FEMA officials worked with EPA and the Center for Disease Control to develop a testing protocol for unoccupied trailers that would, quote, determine formaldehyde concentrations emanating from the trailer under living conditions. EPA officials advised FEMA that the levels we find under testing may well be more than 100 times higher than the health base level, end quote. After receiving this report, FEMA responded by changing the testing protocols. Instead of simulating actual living conditions, which would show high levels of formaldehyde, FEMA directed that the trailers be tested with their windows open, their ventilation fans running, and their air conditioned units operating 24 hours a day. A leading treatise on diagnosing indoor air quality uh, calls testing formaldehyde under these conditions meaningless. FEMA repeatedly received complaints from occupants about high formaldehyde levels, including at least two complaints involving the death of occupants. But the agency brushed the complaints aside. Over 100,000 families have lived in FEMA trailers and manufactured homes, yet the leadership of FEMA refused to take even the most basic steps to protect them from toxic, toxic formaldehyde fumes. Think about it. Families, thousands of families who faced the tragedy of Katrina, lost everything, had their lives turned upside down, then got another hit from the federal government when they were put in trailers that high had high toxic levels of formaldehyde. Yesterday, FEMA finally admitted it made a mistake. It announced it would begin a program to test occupied trailers for dangerous levels of formaldehyde. This is exactly what FEMA's field staff urged over a year ago. But it took this hearing and the prospect that Director Paulison would face tough questions to spur FEMA to act yesterday. FEMA exists to serve the public, but it acts as though protecting Director Paulison from embarrassment is more important than protecting the health of the victims of Hurricane Katrina. Well, it's impossible to read these FEMA documents and not be infuriated. Americans don't mind paying their taxes if they get a government that works. But when that bargain is broken and tax dollars are squandered and health jeopardized, frustration rises and trust in government erodes. At our last hearing, we had Surgeon Generals before us, particularly Surgeon General Carmona. And I said that good, good oversight serves two purposes. It should expose government malfeasance and point the way toward reform. And these are my goals again today. I know the documents we are releasing and the testimony we will hear will reveal mistakes and misjudgments. We need to learn from them to identify what needs to be fixed to protect the health of thousands of families still living in FEMA trailers, two, almost two years after Hurricane Katrina. And we should do everything we can to make sure that this disgraceful conduct never happens again. I want to recognize uh, Ranking Member Tom Davis for his opening statement, and then uh, we're going to proceed with the hearing. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Let me commend uh, Chairman Waxman for agreeing to hold a hearing later this month on disaster preparedness as well. Uh, we wrote the Chairman requesting the hearing, and we appreciate his agreeing to examine where FEMA and DHS stand as we approach the active part of 2007 hurricane season, August and September. A hearing on that important topic confirms our shared interest in conducting important oversight, and we are both eager to learn whether, in today's post-Katrina environment, we are better prepared for natural and man-made disasters than we were two years ago. Sadly, thousands of displaced residents still occupy government property, temporary housing in the Gulf Coast region. And today we are here to discuss the issue of unsafe levels of formaldehyde in FEMA trailers. 
the Select Committee to Investigate the Preparation for and Response to Hurricane Katrina, which I chaired, entitled our final report, A Failure of Initiative, because leadership at all levels failed to get the information they needed and failed to act decisively to meet the crisis. Among those failures was the inability of FEMA to provide timely short-term shelter and adequate long-term housing to those displaced by the catastrophe. As part of the Federal Government's response to Hurricane Katrina and Rita, FEMA acquired thousands of manufactured houses, recreational travel trailers, and larger trailers for use by the victims on the Gulf Coast. These temporary homes contained walls, cabinetry, and other components made of particle board and plywood. The glue or coating used in manufacturing or treating particular board, uh, particle board or plywood often contained formaldehyde, a common chemical used in many industrial and commercial settings. A naturally occurring chemical, formaldehyde is also a byproduct of cigarette smoke. When inhaled in large doses, it can cause extreme discomfort and illness. Over a year ago, FEMA began fielding complaints about noxious odors emanating from some of the occupied trailers. At that time, I wrote Secretary Chertoff asking about the extent of the problem. We received assurances the issues were limited to a small number of units and was under control. In August 2006, FEMA communicated to the committee in no uncertain terms the health and safety of inhabitants was driving the agency's response to the formaldehyde complaints. The committee was told FEMA had partnered with leading government experts, both at the EPA and the CDC, to develop a robust testing program and incident response system. It now seems that FEMA told the committee and what they told us uh, was not completely correct. Apparently, the problem of, un of unsafe formaldehyde levels in FEMA trailers was more widespread than initially acknowledged. And FEMA's reaction to the problem was deliberately stunted to bolster the agency's litigation position. New information recently provided to the committee shows these statements mischaracterized the scope and purpose of FEMA's actual response to the formaldehyde reports. Recently discovered documents make it appear FEMA's primary concerns were legal liability and public relations, not human health and safety. Decisions about assistance to Gulf Coast residents seem to have been driven by the desire to limit litigation, even if that meant limiting genuine testing and risk mitigation efforts as well. One internal email from June 2006 reported the agency's Office of General Counsel, quote, has advised that we do not do testing, unquote, because this would, quote, imply FEMA's ownership of this issue, unquote. Another attorney advised, quote, do not initiate any testing until we give the okay. While I agree we should conduct testing, we should not do so until we are fully prepared to respond to the results. Once you get results, and should they indicate some problem, the clock is running on our duty to respond to them." Unquote. This information is deeply troubling. FEMA was not forthright with congressional investigators. It took nearly a year and a threat of subpoenas for FEMA to produce all the documents the committee requested. After seeing the documents, it is pretty clear why FEMA tried to hide them behind dubious claims of confidentiality and privilege. The information in these documents contradicts what we were told all along, holding them back only highlighted their damning significance. And beyond the litigation-centric process, we have to be concerned about substantive problems, the causes and effects of excessive formaldehyde fumes in housing product purchased by the Federal Government that has still not been addressed. Katrina, Katrina had many hard lessons to teach. One of them was the Federal Government's primary response agency has to be proactive, nimble, and trusted as the honest broker between Washington and those in need at the State and local levels. Reading these documents, I am not persuaded FEMA is that agency yet. The noxious gas in those trailers should have energized FEMA to admit the problem and solve it, not hide it behind a fog of risk-averse lawyering. FEMA's toxic response to these formaldehyde fumes should energize us to demand accountability and push for the reforms that will clear the air and improve the Nation's emergency response capabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Uh, let me ask unanimous consent that Representatives Melanson, Jindel and Taylor be uh, permitted to join us uh, at our hearing today, even though they are not members of the committee. And without objection, we welcome them to uh, our hearing. Uh, I want to uh, welcome our first panel. We are going to hear from uh, Mr. Paulson after this first panel. Uh, we are pleased to have these witnesses who are, who are willing to travel to Washington, D.C. to sh share their experiences with uh, FEMA's trailers with this committee. And I realize these, these experiences have not been pleasant ones, and I thank you all for being here. 
On this first panel, we have Dr. Scott Needle. Dr. Needle is a pediatrician. He obtained his medical degree from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and until June 2007, Dr. Needle had been a pediatrician in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Mary Devaney is an expert in the fields of industrial hygiene and occupational safety. She has an MS in biochemistry from Loyola University in Chicago, and she's a certified safety professional in comprehensive practices, a certified hazardous materials manager, and is qualified as an instructor for OSHA compliance. Uh, Mr. Paul Stewart was an occupant of a FEMA trailer from December 2005 to March 2006. In March 2006, Mr. Stewart was the first FEMA trailer occupant to discuss formaldehyde levels publicly. Lindsay Huckabee and her family have been FEMA mobile home occupants since December 2005. <clears throat> she continues to reside in a trailer along with her husband and five children. James Harris, Jr. is a practicing minister and a small businessman. He and his family have been living in a FEMA trailer since April of 2006. We want to welcome each of you to our hearing today. It's the practice of this committee that all witnesses uh, that testify uh, take an oath, and I'd like to ask you if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this, sub this committee will be the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Okay. Please be seated. <clears throat> the record will indicate that each of the witnesses an answered in the affirmative. We are delighted to have you here. Uh, if you submitted a statement to us, that statement will be made part of the record in full. Uh, I'm going to ha have a clock on for five minutes, and I'd like to ask if you could to try to keep to the five minutes. You run a little over, that's no problem. Uh, the, the little, uh, there's a little um, clock there. You can see it's green, and when um, it, it'll turn orange when there's a minute left and red when the five minutes are up. So you might take a glance over it at some point uh, during your comments. Uh, Dr. Needle, why don't we start with you? There's a button on the base of the mic, and be sure to pull it close to you. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity to testify today at this important hearing. My name is Dr. Scott Needle, and I'm proud to represent the American Academy of Pediatrics. I serve on the Academy's Disaster Preparedness Advisory Council. I'm also a general pediatrician who was until recently in solo private practice in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, an area that experienced some of the worst devastation after Hurricane Katrina. The American Academy of Pediatrics has grave concerns regarding all aspects of the current and future health of children on the Gulf Coast who continue to recover after Katrina. We appreciate your efforts today to bring attention to the potential risks to children's health associated with exposure to formaldehyde gas in the trailers provided by FEMA after the hurricane. Formaldehyde gas is known to cause a wide range of health effects. The AAP Handbook on Pediatric Environmental Health cautions that, quote, formaldehyde is a known respiratory irritant in the occupational setting and warns that it can also be found as an air pollutant in residential settings. The Federal Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, the ATSDR, states, and I quote, children may be more susceptible than adults to the respiratory effects of formaldehyde. Children may be more vulnerable to corrosive agents than adults because of the relatively smaller diameter of their airways. Children may be more vulnerable because of relatively increased minute ventilation per kilogram and failure to evacuate an area promptly when exposed. Studies since 1990 have found higher rates of asthma, chronic bronchitis, and allergies in children exposed to high levels of formaldehyde. In 2004, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, an arm of the World Health Organization, classified formaldehyde as a known carcinogen. The U.S. National Toxicology Program classifies it as, quote, reasonably anticipated to be a human carcinogen. Formaldehyde is used in hundreds of products, but particularly in the resins used to bond laminated wood products and to bind wood chips in particle board. Mobile homes and travel trailers, which have small enclosed spaces, low exchange rates of air, and many particle board furnishings may have much higher concentrations of formaldehyde than other types of homes. My concern in this issue stems from my experiences in treating children of Hancock County, Mississippi during the weeks and months after Hurricane Katrina. In spring 2006, certain patterns of illness emerged among some of my patients. Many children returned repeatedly to my office with symptoms that would not go away or would clear up and then promptly recur. Sinus infections, ear infections, cold, and a variety of other respiratory symptoms. 
In talking with these families, I found that they shared two common characteristics. First, they were all living in travel trailers provided by FEMA. Second, the families reported that these symptoms started not long after moving into these trailers. Research revealed my patient's symptoms were all consistent with exposure to formaldehyde. At the same time, the Sierra Club released the results of initial testing, which found 29 out of 31 trailers with elevated levels of formaldehyde over 0.1 parts per million. Over the subsequent year, I contacted the Mississippi State Department of Health, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, researchers at various Gulf Coast universities and others to alert them to the patterns I was seeing. Unfortunately, my efforts did not lead to any immediate action, and I am therefore personally and professionally grateful to you for bringing attention to this issue through this hearing. The American Academy of Pediatrics remains deeply concerned that Gulf Coast children continuing to reside in FEMA trailers may have been and may continue to be exposed to levels of formaldehyde that are hazardous to both short-term and long-term health. The Academy urges FEMA and federal health agencies to undertake a systematic, scientifically rigorous study of the issue to determine children's exact exposure levels, correlation with reported symptoms, and the practical and concrete steps that can be taken to safeguard their health. Furthermore, the Academy urges FEMA to set standards for formaldehyde levels in trailers purchased by the agency that are consistent with the most current science, including an additional margin of safety that takes into account the special vulnerabilities of children. Finally, the Academy encourages FEMA to explore alternative options for providing short and long-term housing to disaster victims that would pose fewer health risks than the travel trailers currently occupied since Hurricane Katrina. The American Academy of Pediatrics commends you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing today to call attention to the potential hazards of formaldehyde exposure among Gulf Coast children residing in the FEMA trailers. We look forward to working with Congress to minimize the exposure of children and all Americans to potentially toxic chemicals in these and other settings. I appreciate this opportunity to testify, and I'll be pleased to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Deedle. Mr. Vanny, we're pleased to have you. Good morning. My name is Mary Devaney, and I'm a scientist specializing in industrial hygiene, the recognition and control of occupational and environmental health and safety concerns. I'd like to thank Congressman Waxman, Congressman Davis, and the other congressional representatives that decided to hold this hearing and attend today. I also wish to thank my husband, Wesley Leishbrook, a, a certified industrial hygienist who returned just five months ago from active duty in Iraq. If it were not for his research, knowledge, and support, I could not have been here today. I want to share some information to help you take action because we Americans have the ability to give our disaster victims safe and secure housing, free from known hazards that every American wants and deserves. As you know, formaldehyde is a component in manufacturing of particle board, press board, fiber board, paneling, glues, countertops, and other materials, including some adhesives used to lay carpeting. Since these materials are so common, everyone is exposed to some degree. However, when the exposure gets elevated, we experience symptoms including headache, dizziness, nausea, loss of sense of smell, and fatigue, respiratory system irritation, nosebleeds, sinus infection, throat irritation, coughing, and chest congestion occur as well. Eye and skin itching, burning, and skin eruptions occur. Formaldehyde also makes many pre-existing medical conditions worse, including asthma, allergies that affect the sinuses, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, skin diseases such as eczema, and migraine headaches. Over the long term, we know that formaldehyde can cause changes to certain cells in the immune system. Skin and respiratory sensitization can also occur in some people, making them have serious health effects with even very low exposures and changes in nasal and nasal pharyngeal cells occur that can develop into cancer. According to the National Cancer Institute, it may also cause brain cancer and possibly leukemia. Regarding exposure limits, the scientific community recommends limits based on two main groups, adults in the workplace and the population at large. Agencies such as OSHA, NIOSH, and the military base their limits on the average adult worker not sensitized to formaldehyde and and this is critical. Uh, per people who are exposed for an average of only 8 to 10 hours per day, 40 hours per week, with the rest of the hours each day and week away from the exposure source. So these levels can be set much higher because the away from exposure source recovery time 
assist these people and their bodies in recovering from their exposures. Levels set by agencies such as the EPA, the ATSDR, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, and many state agencies, agencies as well as the World Health Organization set exposure standards aimed to protect nearly all of our most vulnerable citizens, including the elderly, infants, and people that are medically compromised. Workplace and military standards do not protect this at-risk segment of our population. Because of concern for the health of individuals living in these trailers, over a year ago, the Sierra Club began sampling trailers in Mississippi. Within a couple of months after being informed of the high levels, FEMA had sampling conducted by the EPA. The Sierra Club sampled 69 trailers. The EPA tested 96. Their results were similar. Nearly all of the trailers sampled had formaldehyde levels at least three times the proposed level for healthy, physically fit sailors exposed to formaldehyde on a submarine for only 90 days. That population group even excludes medically unfit soldiers. One of the responses FEMA just implemented was to adopt for new travel trailers the low HUD particle board and plywood emissions regulations that only applied to mobile homes. By closing this loophole, FEMA is showing commitment to the health of the inhabitants of these brand new trailers. However, approximately 86,000 people are still living in the old travel trailers. And according to the sampling results, most of these triggers have unacceptably high levels of formaldehyde. So what can we do? Manufacturers can substitute soy-based adhesives for formaldehyde-based ones. We can give people who are sick different trailers or other temporary housing. We can educate trailer occupants on formaldehyde health effects and give them options for relo relocating. We can ensure that people without symptoms are removed from hazardous exposures by testing all existing trailers before they develop the symptoms. And we must require manufacturers to cure and off-gas formaldehyde at the manufacturing level. In addition, we should test the formaldehyde level in each trailer prior to acceptance and delivery of new trailers. We should not sell or donate empty vacated trailers that have eleva elevated formaldehyde levels to Native Americans or others before ensuring that the levels are safe. These are routine, there are routine procedures to cure formaldehyde in empty trailers that should be implemented. In conclusion, the elevated exposures to this toxic, irritating, and cancer-causing gas in FEMA-issued travel trailers has developed into a major public health concern. Now that we have recognized the problem, Americans need to take prompt, effective action to help these disaster victims and safeguard their health. We have the tools. We now need Congress to take decisive action. We owe this to our fellow Americans who have been victimized again through no fault of their own. And I'm ready for questions. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Devaney. Mr. Stewart, pleased to have you. There's a button on the base of the mic. Be sure it's pressed in and pull it close to him. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Waxman and members of the committee, it's a great honor to be here today and to discuss the experiences my wife and I endured with FEMA and the temporary trail they provided us. But at the same time, it's sad that this hearing has to take place at all. On December 2nd, 2005, FEMA delivered our camper. When we first took possession of the camper, we noticed a strong new smell inside the camper. <clears throat> we aired out the camper as FEMA instructed, turning on the heat, opening the windows, turning on the exhaust vent. The camper stayed that way for the next four months. The first night we stayed in the camper, my wife woke up several times with a runny nose. At one point, she turned the light on and realized that her runny nose was actually a bloody nose. <clears throat> I was also beginning to show symptoms of my own, which included scratchy eyes, scratchy throat, coughing, and runny nose. The symptoms we had continued for weeks, then months, and we finally thought about just leaving. But at the time, we couldn't leave. We were still fighting with the Army Corps of Engineers, with FEMA. We had debris all over our yard. Money was short, and we were stuck. Then one morning when I woke up, I found our pet cockatiel was very lethargic, unable to move. He was regurgitating, unable to keep his balance. I immediately called the veterinarian who told us to get him out of the camper immediately. So we did, we took him outside. We got ready to leave and within an hour, the bird was beginning to get better. He wasn't better, but he was getting better. We took him to the veterinarian who told us that the camper was probably making him sick. We asked him how that was possible and he said that, well, there were many chemicals inside the camper, especially a new one. He said that formaldehyde was the most likely cause. 
He said, if we don't get the bird out of there, the bird will probably die. He explained to us that birds, much like children, breathe much more rapidly than adults, and they take in much more of the toxins that are inside the camper, and that he's going to show symptoms before we do, but that we should also get out. <clears throat> From that point on, we kept the bird out as often as, outside as often as we could, and we really do believe that that bird saved our lives. At that point, I started to research formaldehyde and started to find out what formaldehyde can do to us and others like us who were living in these campers. What I found out almost immediately is that the EPA lists uh, formaldehyde as a carcinogen. Um, there was also a common problem inside the campers and that all the smoke detectors inside the FEMA campers would go off for no reason at all. You'd go into FEMA campers and find the batteries ripped out, smoke detectors torn off, torn off the wall and so forth. Um, what I found out was that formaldehyde can set off smoke detectors. I checked with a firefighter friend of mine who knew someone in the industry and they did confirm that formaldehyde at high levels would set off smoke detectors. I then called FEMA and talked to them about the problems and they told me to quote, air out the camper. I explained to them that I'd been airing out the camper for four months and they said, well, continue to air out the camper. They also told me that some people are just quote, more chemically sensitive than others. That statement kind of made me angry. <clears throat> As a former U.S. Army Infantry officer and as a former police officer, I've been tased, pepper sprayed, I've been through CS gas chambers, and I do not consider myself to be a chemically sensitive person. Anyways, I started to look for ways to mitigate the problem. What I did first was I tore out all of the exposed particle board I could find. I replaced it with pine plank. I then went ahead, that did nothing, I then went ahead and bought some ferns that the Stennis Space Center said to use to try and reduce formaldehyde. That didn't work either. I then got a substance used by the mortuary business to try and absorb formaldehyde. That didn't work. Then I purchased a, an air purifier, a professional one, 15 pound charcoal filter. It moves um, 400 cubic feet of air per minute and it's designed to cover 1,500 square feet. That also had no effect. Eventually I ended up testing my own camper after I called FEMA numerous times and asked them to help and they refused. When I tested my camper, I found a company called American Chemical Sensors out of Boca Raton, Florida. They mailed me a uh, test kit and actually told me that I should get out of the camper when they heard of our symptoms. They said our symptoms made it look as though we were having formaldehyde poisoning. I got the, the sensor, hung it inside the camper and took it down, mailed it back to the company and when I got the results, the results were 0.22 parts per million or twice what the EPA considers safe. I called FEMA and told them what was going on and they told me that quote, I should be happy with the camper that I have and that we do not have any other campers to supply you. I couldn't believe what FEMA was telling me. Essentially, they were telling me that they were going to do nothing about the problem, even though I've already alerted them that what we were living in was, was cancer causing. During this time, I also started to dig around, and I, what I did find was an OSHA study dated October 11, 2005, 43 days after Hurricane Katrina. The OSHA study tested outside ambient air at a past Christian trailer holding facility. That outside ambient air tested as high as five parts per million. Not 0.5 parts per million, but five parts per million outdoor ambient air. I called FEMA, told them what I found, and again they told me, sorry, there's nothing we can do for you. At that point I called the local television station and they decided to run the story. The next morning at 8 o'clock in the morning I got a call from FEMA who told me they were on their way with a new camper. The new camper arrived and when it did, the FEMA representatives arrived shortly before the camper did and wanted to cut my sewer lines, my water lines, and pull the camper out. I refused. I wouldn't let them. When the camper showed up, it showed up in front of the driveway. I walked outside, didn't even walk up to the camper, and I could smell the formaldehyde from my driveway. The workers who delivered the camper also said they could not go inside. The formaldehyde was so bad. I told them to take the camper and go home. I didn't want it. At that point, FEMA called me at one point and said, quote, what are we going to have to do to make you happy? And they said also, so you didn't refuse it because of the type of camper it was. During that conversation, they also wanted to record my conversation with them, which I thought was kind of strange. I've worked in police work for a number of years, and I can tell you that what it sounded to me like is that they were trying to get together a chain of custody. They were trying to put together evidence. I felt like a criminal. <clears throat> Anyways, I had refused that camper, and at that point, FEMA um, brought me another new camper. Um, I know I'm running out of time, sir, so I apologize. Um, when they brought me the, the, the third camper, I got a call, and they said, we're going to bring you a camper. We've inspected this camper. There is no formaldehyde inside this camper. My wife and I were pretty excited. They said, we've had people go through this camper, and we can assure you this camper is brand new. They, they talked about the options that were in the camper and so forth. 
And my wife and I said, we're not really concerned about the options, we just want a safe place to live. They brought the camper to us, and when the camper showed up, they had approximately 15 FEMA people on my property. There was a public relations person there, there were officials there. Anyways, they brought the camper in, they convinced us, the public relations woman convinced us that the camper was fine, there was nothing wrong with it, there was no formaldehyde in it, so we let her take our old camper. They delivered the camper, and the people went about setting it up. It took them most of the day, and by the time my wife and I could get in there, it was dark. When we went to go inside the camper, the public relations woman said, okay, I can't stay around any longer, I have to leave, so she left. When she left, my wife and I realized immediately upon entering the camper that it was not new, in fact, it was used. The stove was dirty, the floors were dirty, it, it was filthy inside. I said to my wife, we can clean this, let's just get to work now, we can get it done before bed. The first thing I did was take back the bed sheet, and when I did, I noticed there were bugs inside the bed. Literally bugs in the bed. I called the public relations woman back and said, I can't sleep in this bed. And she said, well, there's nothing I can do for you until Friday, I won't be able to help you until Monday morning. I explained to her that if I can't have a place to sleep, I'm gonna to have to go back living in my truck again. And she said, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do for you, you're gonna to have to do what you have to do. I said, there's absolutely nothing you can do for me. She said, well, I can get you a hotel room in Pensacola, Florida, but I can only put you in there for one night. I said, ma'am, I'm in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. To get to Pensacola, Florida right now, it wouldn't be 2 a.m. till I get there and for one night, it's just not worth my time. She said, well, then you're gonna to have to wait till Monday, we'll take care of you on Monday. Anyways, this went back and forth and back and forth for, for a long amount of time with FEMA. It wasn't long after that that I was visited by two members of FEMA. They showed up at the house on Sunday night. They said they wanted to see the camper. The one person who showed up identified himself as the head of the Mississippi Camper Program. He said to me that FEMA will do whatever it takes to fix the problem. He said if he had to have 10 workers work two days straight, he would take care of everything. The interesting thing with this conversation is that I asked him at one point where he was staying. He was from out of state. He said, I'm renting a gutted apartment in Gulfport. He wasn't staying in a FEMA camper, he was staying in an apartment in Gulfport, taking up rental housing that really should have gone to the residents of the Gulf Coast. After going through this for a number of days and spending five more days in my truck in my driveway, I finally had enough with FEMA and I told them to take their property and get off my land. At that point they came back and took their camper and I went out and purchased my own camper, which I will tell you is formaldehyde free. <clears throat> The interesting thing about that camper is my wife and I paid $50,000 for that camper. It has a king size bed, a fireplace, it has a washer and dryer, it has computer workstations. It is a very large camper with three slide outs, very comfortable. From everything I've read up to this point, FEMA has paid approximately $65,000 for each one of the campers that they supplied to Gulf Coast residents after the storm. As I sit in front of you today, I just wanna say that I am one of the lucky ones. My wife and I were safe, were safe now, we're out of our camper. We're, we're no longer exposed to that level of formaldehyde, but there are tens of thousands of people who are still there living in those campers every day. And in conclusion, I just wanna say that we lost a great deal through our dealings with FEMA, not least of which is our faith in government. And I can truly say that a, a, a buzz term that's been used around Washington for a long time is a culture of life. And I just think that a culture of life really ends up just being rhetoric when you see things like this. It's, it's not real world. And in the real world, you're on your own. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stewart. Mrs. Huckabee. I'd like to start by thanking Chairman Waxman and the members of the committee for taking the time to address this important issue. My name is Lindsay Huckabee. I live in Kiln, Mississippi in a FEMA-provided mobile home with my five children and my husband. On August 29th of 2005, we lived in an apartment in Past Christian. We learned days later that our apartment and all of its contents had been destroyed. We contacted FEMA, and they told us that because of our family size, we did qualify for a single wide mobile home. We were very excited and felt very blessed. We were told that if we cleared the site, provided our own septic, our own water, and our own electricity, that they would deliver the camper. We had everything ready by mid-November. On December 14th, our new home was delivered and set up. We realized upon moving in that there was a strange smell to it. It made our eyes water, our throats itch. Um, we had numerous respiratory problems, but we assumed that we had never had a new trailer before. We just assumed that it was the, the plastics and all that kind of stuff. Um, I began having migraine headaches and preterm labor. My daughter, who had been asthma free for about a year, we had just discussed on August 3rd at her four year checkup that she had probably outgrown it. She began having asthma attacks Three of my children began having severe nosebleeds several times a week. 
my husband began having problems with his sinuses as well. After three weeks of preterm labor stopped by medication, our youngest son, Michael, was delivered four weeks early. All of my other children were born on time. We brought him home from the hospital. He was healthy. About three days after being home, his sinuses became congested. Today, he's 18 months old, and his sinuses have not cleared up for more than a week or two at a time. My daughter, Layla, who was four when we received the trailer, had most of the problems. She's had pneumonia several times. She's had more ear infections than I can count. She's been put on steroids, breathing treatments. She's been sent to the hospital with pneumonia and been hospitalized three times to date. She was sent to an ENT where she underwent allergy testing, an MRI of her sinuses, and they put tubes in her ears to, so that the excess fluid her sinuses were producing could escape. He, the only thing that he had to say whenever I asked about the allergy test was that she was allergy free and there seemed to be some kind of irritant that she was being exposed to. He then asked me if we were living in a FEMA trailer. I told him we were. He said that there were chemicals in those trailers that could be making children sick. He said it was too early to tell, but he had seen an increase in patients repeatedly with the same problems. We took Layla to an allergy and asthma specialist. They did another allergy test and found nothing. I never thought that I would be upset to hear there was nothing wrong with my child, but if it was an allergy, at least we had something we could fight. The idea of our home making us sick was not really something that we were ready to grasp since we had no other place to go. The allergy asthma specialist had also seen an increase in patients with mild to moderate asthma becoming very severe. After an inhaled steroid twice a day, an oral steroid, and allergy medication once a day, Layla's asthma is now under control. Layla missed 42 days of kindergarten this year. I had to deal with the truancy officers at school, even though all but three of these days were excused by doctor's visits, hospitalizations, and surgeries. The school nurse has called me more times than I can count to go pick her up because of a nosebleed that wouldn't stop and fevers that were caused by ear infections that wouldn't go away. Looking back, she would have been better off staying at school than coming home to the environment that was making her sick. After months and months of office visits and phone calls, I was frustrated. I came home one afternoon and found my daughter. Her hand was over her nose. She was covered in blood, her hand, her arms, her shirt. The most frightening thing later when I thought about it was I didn't rush to her. Not for a second did I think that there was anything wrong with my kid other than a nosebleed. It is very sad to me that I've gotten to the point to where it is a common practice to see my child covered in blood and it did not scare me. Um, our pediatrician had made a link also with the, the FEMA the FEMA occupants and the patients having increased problems. It was through him that I was contacted by the Sierra Club to do a formaldehyde test on our trailer. We did the test. It came back at 0.18 parts per million, almost two times the legal or the recommended limit. This was after 16 months of living there, after airing out our trailer, after running the AC nonstop, opening windows and doors whenever we weren't home. So I can only imagine what it was for the 16 months that we were there beforehand. Three weeks ago, my husband was having his teeth cleaned and they found a mass in his soft palate. They referred him to an ENT. He had a CAT scan. The ENT said that he needed to have it removed immediately. The mass ended up being a polymorphic adenoma tumor. While no one can say for sure if it was caused by formaldehyde or not, my husband is an otherwise healthy 30-year-old non-smoker man. And this is something that the ENT said that could be the beginning of what we will see on a long-term basis for the formaldehyde exposure. What makes me so angry is that for me, FEMA is providing these trailers to disaster victims. They said that they have inspected these trailers and deemed them safe. I do not believe that FEMA set out to harm people of the Gulf Coast. I have to have more faith in our government than that. But I do think that it was handled very poorly whenever they were notified. We had contacted FEMA over and over again about something making our family sick and several problems, and we were met with much resistance. Whenever we told them about our levels of formaldehyde, they replaced our trailer um, in June of this year. We had that formaldehyde tested as well, and it is still over the limit. Whenever we called FEMA, the level is lower than the other one was, and she said, so we're good, right? Um, we're not finished moving into this trailer, and I don't believe we will. I think that it is um, very silly to expose my children to this unnecessary risk whenever, and we were told ahead of time that this trailer was completely formaldehyde free. It was used, it was built in 2005 by a different manufacturer. Um, in closing, I would like to say that I represent 
um, probably the medium of the problem. There are people who are, who are in severe cases and far worse than mine. And it is scary to me that people who don't know about formaldehyde don't know what to look out for because if you look at the nosebleeds, the colds, the sinus infections separately, you just think that your kids are staying sick. I asked my pediatrician more times than I can count. My house is clean. I'm you know, keeping them away from people who are sick. What can I do to keep these kids healthy? And it is so frustrating as a mother to go back and forth. And it feels like you're failing whenever you can't keep your kids out of the hospital and you can't keep them sick. And I think that the other people of the Gulf Coast need to be publicly notified of what symptoms to watch for because they could be silently suffering and not realize what's making them sick. Thank you very much, Mrs. Huckabee. Mr. Harris? I would first like to thank God uh, for truly blessing me to be here today uh, before you at this time in our history. I would like to thank the chairman and members of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee for the opportunity to share my experiences with you at this time. My name is James D. Harris, Jr. I am 46 years old, and I have been blessed with a wonderful wife of 17 years named Maritha. And God saw fit to bless us with a son of six years old, and his name is James D. Harris, Jr. And of course, we call him Trey. I am self-employed with Agape Trey Graphics and Marketing Group, and I am also a minister of the gospel. I've been blessed to be in the ministry for over 20 years, uh, focusing those efforts mainly in the southern region of the United States. My small business was established in 1999 and continued to grow until the disaster known as Hurricane Katrina came on the Gulf Coast. Since the hurricane, my business has diminished and my ability to prosper from that endeavor has been hampered by overall economic recovery here on the Gulf Coast. I was blessed to start a nonprofit organization named the Guardian Angel Adoption Program with a website address of www.guardianangelprogram.org. And it has been a blessing to many families here on the Gulf Coast. The nonprofit endeavor was formed after witnessing the unfortunate oversight of many families and seniors who were uh, tragically left behind or out of the recovery and rejuvenation efforts of some of the other agencies here on the Gulf Coast. I must state for the record, there is still a great need of services for people like these and, and needs like these of the public at large, especially here on the Gulf Coast. If someone would have told me three years ago that I would be living in a FEMA trailer with my wife and son, I, I, I just wouldn't have believed that. But the reality is that I am in a FEMA trailer and have been living here since uh, April 2006 until now. Many people that I have come in contact with are in the same position that my family and I are in now. This sometimes overlooked necessity is truly a bit, uh, well, I must state for the record that I am thankful to have a roof over my head and shelter from the elements. And uh, I just want to say that it's a blessing to have somewhere to stay. By nature, I'm not one to complain about uh, my circumstances or situations that I find myself in from time to time. God has allowed me the strength to endure and to maintain as much as possible, especially during the trying times after Hurricane Katrina. I must say I have never witnessed firsthand in my life the overpowering devastation that one event could have on so many people. With all that being said, my life has been changed as so many others have during the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And I must say I will, I will never be the same again. My family and I have experienced many challenges in pursuit of getting the FEMA trailer we now have. Time will not mi permit me to address some of those challenges, in fact, but I will say that I have ever exercised every bit of knowledge that I have experienced and plain old luck to get positioned to be in the facility 
at this time. When my family and I entered into the trailer in April 2006, we noticed a pungent and overpowering odor that permeated through the whole FEMA travel trailer. You must understand that the three of us are living in a space less than 50 square feet. There is one bathroom and only one door for access in or out. We also noticed that our eyes burned and watered as we tried to inhabit the trailer facility. We were told by the persons who gave us the keys to the trailers initially that if we opened the doors and windows of the trailer and allowed the trailer to air out for a period of a couple of hours, that all the odors and the burning sensations of our eyes would pass and would not come back. Over a period of time and to this date, we have found that this remedy did not remove the strong odors that we now know to be formaldehyde. On many occasions, my wife and I contacted the FEMA maintenance number to register our concerns and express our displeasure in the frequency and the magnitude of the odors and the visual challenges that being in the trailer possess, presented when these conditions existed. The reply we received from the FEMA maintenance call center was the same stating, you need to allow the trailer to air out when you smell these odors. There was never any attempt that I know of to physically try to address this concern. There were other physical conditions that have arisen inside the trailer and outside the trailer, and they have for the most part been addressed. But this particular issue seems to have continued to be addressed to us in the same fashion. Now you must also understand that my family and I stayed in one room on the north side of my parents' home after Hurricane Katrina. The southern exposure of my parents' home was compromised and destroyed by the hurricane's fury. My parents, my brother and his wife and two sons, and my family and I existed in the remnant of my parents' homes for eight months. So when we were finally able to get in a FEMA trailer, we were so thankful and continue to try to make things work. I never realized until late that we might even have the possibility of being moved into another more adequate and more environmentally safe trailer. Not being aware of that fact, I know that this is one of the main reasons why after notifying the FEMA maintenance center about the formaldehyde and how it was affecting us on numerous occasions, we just decided to make the best of the situation. I must note at this point that when, we, when uh, we noticed often that the companies that FEMA was contracting, the maintenance trailers uh, were, uh, were in charge of that particular process, uh, were changing almost every two weeks. Uh, this frequent changing of the guards, I believe, directly affected in, in which, uh, the way in which this situation was handled and eventually never truly was addressed. I would uh, notice along with my wife that if we ever left the home for more than five to six hours when we returned, the smells and odors would sometimes be overpowering. This means we had to air out our trailers on several occasions, losing time while we were waiting for the air quality to resume to some level of acceptability. And we figured this was to be our accepted existence in this FEMA trailer. This happened many times during our occupancy of the trailer. When I felt there was no other avenue available to me, I had to find a way with God's help to make the air quality in the trailer the best uh, that I could. I purchased an Auric <laughs> XL tabletop professional air purifier in July 2006 uh, for four thousand uh, $469 and 95 cents. I, I had to borrow the money to purchase this air filter, but I did what I felt I had to do to protect my family to exist day to day. Without this filter, I don't even know if we could have been in the trailer at all. Uh, and let me close in saying this. Since we have been in the trailer, we have had to nebulize our son several times, and my wife and I believe this goes directly to the lack of air quality at times in the trailer. My wife has also had bouts with breathing, and I have had several respiratory incidents 
the latest of which occurred on Thursday, July 12, 2007. The smell of the, of the formaldehyde was so strong and so overwhelming that my eyes and my family's eyes were discomforted and uh, we just opened up the uh, windows and everything and uh, it got so bad that this past Tuesday I actually had to go to the emergency room. Um, I'm not going to read the rest of the statement, you have it for the record. But in closing, I would like to say to you all, um, I don't know, I didn't even know that government was concerned. And when I found out about this, I just want to let you know I'm thankful to know that somebody is concerned. When you're helpless, it's one thing. But when you're hopeless, it's something else. So I hope that something's done about this uh, problem. And I'm free to answer any questions that you might have for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Harris. I want to thank all of you. It's not easy to come and testify before Congress is sharing your experiences, which were not happy ones. But it's important that you're here, and this is a very helpful presentation. I'm now going to recognize members to ask questions, and I'm going to start with myself. I, I, you've told us just compelling stories of what happened to your families. And uh, I guess the question we, ha we want to know is, are these isolated incidents, or are they widespread? Dr. Needle, do you have any information about that? <coughs> Um, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's been very difficult to get a handle on the numbers. And part of this is because, as, um, as the other presenters have, have testified, the symptoms are not anything in and of themselves unusual. They're very common things. I mean, myself as a pediatrician, this was part of the problem that I ran into is, you know, if I would try and go back to my medical records or try and pinpoint mm -hmm. who might be suffering, um, you know, they're having cold. So a lot of people would infections. suffer. Kids would come in to see you, and they they wouldn't associate with formaldehyde. Exactly. Is that, is that right, Ms. Devaney? That's right. Exactly. And um, some of you said thousands of people are living in trailers. Is that is that a, an accurate statement, Ms. Devaney? I would say it's, it's certainly accurate, or even more than accurate. Maybe more like tens of thousands. The trouble is. Almost every trailer that FEMA sampled, unoccupied, continuously ventilated for three weeks, almost all of them had elevation levels 100 times the recommended exposure limits. Those were, those were uh, trailers that were not occupied with the windows open, the air conditioning going, and then it's still very high levels. Extremely high levels. And, and like I said in my testimony, the Sierra Club's levels were similar. Almost all the trailers had elevated levels that not only would not be allowed in the workplace for normal, healthy adults mm -hmm. who are able to leave work and not be exposed, but certainly dangerous levels for our, our more fragile and sensitive segments of the population, children, adults with compromised immune systems, other pre-existing skin conditions, respiratory conditions. And in that same vein, I am very, very concerned as an industrial hygienist about the people who have not complained about problems, who are afraid to complain about the problems for fear their trailer will be taken away from them, or don't have the money, or speak the language well enough, or have any idea who to turn to or where to go for help. Yeah, that's, a, that's a very much of a problem. And from the, uh, from I these samples, we know all, the vast majority of these trailers are too, are, have levels way too high for anyone to live in. Well, that's, that's the story of the vast majority, and you know because you've done sampling of it. But we know only of one instance where FEMA sampled a trailer, and that was a, a case where, according to their documents that were submitted to us, maybe they sampled others, but um, th there was a... Um, trailer that was occupied by Carlton and Don Sistrunk, a husband and wife with a four-month-old daughter. The Sistrunk was also two months pregnant. We got a signed statement from her that she complained and complained and complained. And in February 2006, they, they sent somebody out to test it. And uh, after they went out there and tested that trailer, they found formaldehyde levels of 1.2 parts per million 
and she was told not to re-enter her trailer. It was 75 times higher than the guidelines for formaldehyde exposure set by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, in that case, after that case, the FEMA people out on the field were saying, this is a real problem, we've got to do something about it. But after they got to the Washington people, the theme that we see consistently is that um, uh, they, they wanted to ignore the problem. They just uh, wanted to act as if it didn't exist. So what we had is indifference to the suffering of people who were already suffering because of Hurricane Katrina. And this is from an agency that's supposed to serve the public. Um, we found in the documents that uh, the Washington FEMA lawyers told their field staff, do not initiate any testing until we give you the okay. Once you get results, should they indicate some problem, the clock is running on our duty to respond to them. Well, it looks like they thought their duty was not to respond, not to know, to just be ignorant and let people suffer. In fact, I thought this was remarkable. According to one internal FEMA email, it read, according to HQ, there are no health concerns associated with the formaldehyde inside our FEMA, mobile homes, trailer, uh, travel trailers. That's what they were saying, that there were no health concerns. Well, that just belies what the medical people and the others who suffered directly from the formaldehyde levels know from your own experience. Mr. Uh, Chairman, if I may, yes. um, and I think uh, we've been calling on the Gulf Coast for some time that the reason, for instance, I cannot give you a straight answer as to how many people are affected by this problem is the short answer is we don't know. And I think it warrants uh, a study to find out exactly how many people are suffering, how many have come forward to FEMA or to the media or other agencies, and how many are, as Ms. Devaney said, basically suffering in silence. We don't have the answers to that. Yeah. And, and may I say to that, yes, Mr. Harris. Uh, Mr. Chairman and other members, when you don't know what to do, you tend to try to make the best of the situation. And when they talk about people suffering in silence, I think that people don't know what to do, so they make the best of the situation because even when they come to do the inspections, and th they did an inspection with us about a week ago. Mm -hmm. They told us, we complained again, they said, well, we're not the ones that handle that. You need to call the FEMA call center and let them handle it. But when you call them, they tell you that you need to get with the inspectors. So we don't even have a direct line of who to actually call to find out how to handle uh, the situation. So I would say to you, we need to know what to do and who to call so that we can, you know, try to make a change. A absolutely. This is government bureaucracy at its worst. It's the government failing the people who have already suffered from the hurricane and are now suffering from a health danger. I want to move on to the other members, but I'm sure you'll get a chance to uh, answer some of these points or make some of the points you want. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'd like you to uh, recognize Mr. Issa first, but uh, I could ask unanimous consent to put a statement in the record by the Manufactured Housing Institute, which talks about their standards for building, and a statement by Lee D. Scholl, who is a Ph.D. and a principal toxicologist and risk assessor. Without objection, that will be put in the record. And I would also ask unanimous consent that the uh, uh, affidavit that we have from Carlton and Don Sistrunk uh, be made part of the record as well. Without objection, that will be the order. So uh, you are now uh, five minutes, your, your time, and you are yielding to uh, Mr. Eisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing today. I don't often uh, get an opportunity to say not only is this a bipartisan or even a nonpartisan issue, but it is one that we uh, we're only just beginning to touch. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm going <clears> to <throat> beg your indulge indulgence and say that at this point I have no doubt that either through public hearings or through staff research we are clearly going to have to do a follow-up on the effects of formaldehyde since there seems to be a dichotomy between what our own government says the effects are and what we're hearing here today. I would also ask that at least 
on the merits uh, on paper that we do a follow up on the industry that produces these products i think they're not here they're not being heard from here today and they may very well uh, be unfairly tarnished for what happened in this case having said that it is very clear that we need to direct fema to find out why these trailers, in an industry in which people routinely purchase uh, both travel trailers and single and double wide uh, relocatable homes and have no such problems uh, that I'm aware of, and it's millions of homes in America, why these particular trailers or a large subsection of these trailers enjoyed this, uh, this elevated level. I think that we have to direct FEMA to hold some accountability as to the specific manufacturers that delivered these products, uh, which again goes to the question of, of virtually universal testing to find out where the shortcuts may have been taken. Last but not least, uh, I have uh, taken the liberty, and, and I would, my questions will be directed in this way, of reading ahead the FEMA administrator's uh, opening statement. And it may surprise all of you if you haven't had a chance to read it. Have any of you? You haven't. Well, then I'll, I'll give you something that may surprise you. And I'm hoping that the administrator will rethink his opening statement. It includes such things as only 58 trailer units have been replaced because of formaldehyde concerns, 18 in Louisiana, 30 in Mississippi, 8 in Texas, 2 in Alabama five additional formaldehyde complaints in Mississippi and Texas have resulted in occupants being moved to rental housing resources. So I guess the number goes up ever so slightly. This relatively uh, cavalier statement about the, the problem being that small because of the only people who have been resolved might in fact show us that, uh, that FEMA has a large problem is reducing it, and their opening statement talks in terms of cosmetics, shoe polishes, and other things which use formaldehyde as though these are self-induced uh, elevated levels. So without going into the entire statement, uh, and with that warning to the next uh, panel, uh, are any of you surprised that, uh, that only 58 plus 5 are, are in fact of concern today to uh, FEMA? Mrs. Huckabee, any, anyone? Um, I, I would like to say that I'm not overly surprised that that many have been replaced, considering the fact that it took about 14 months of constant complaining, saying something's making us sick, for them to get around to it. Um, I am kind of disappointed that from, and pardon me if it was not intended that way, but it sounds like they're using that number to minimize the problem rather than say this is what has been solved. And um, that, that I find highly disappointing. D does it surprise you? Uh, well, let me rephrase that. When you're looking at the people, the three of you that, uh, that dealt directly with FEMA representatives, uh, they offered you alternate trailers. They obviously had, in some cases, they obviously had, well, they, they eventually did give you an alternate trailer. Uh, yes, sir. But uh, apparently they were willing to expend a considerable amount of money. Do, are you of the belief that this was a resource limitation? Uh, because we, in, on this side, allocated a considerable amount of money do you believe it was resource or authority limited, if you can use those two, uh, for those who were directly affected? It was, it was authoritative. <clears throat> um, and, and in fact, if, it, it's very difficult to go through a statement like this with the time limitations because you don't get across what, you really, you know, what really happened to you. What happened to us was a very long process, and it would take us most of the day to discuss it. But it, it was, from, from the statements they made to me, they were degrading. They, they, it was like we were asking for something else, like they were giving us something. And, and I've told people over and over again, we are just like every other taxpaying citizen in the United States that just happened to lose everything we own in the span of a couple of hours. And, you know, we're not just alone. And, and at the beginning of the, the statement, I was actually going to read it, and I, and I didn't for time's sake. But one of the things I was going to ask everybody up here to understand, and even the people who, who are behind us who are going to testify next, Imagine when you left your house this morning, you made sure the stove was off, you locked up your house, you made sure everything was in its place, and when you go home tonight, your house is gone. And everything that's in it is gone. And your neighbor's house is gone, and your neighborhood is gone, and your town hall is gone, stores everything. We, we didn't ask for this, but the way FEMA treated us was as if we were charity cases that when you called them with a problem, it wasn't a problem to them. To them, you were asking for something better. 
Well, and and that, that's the, that's the, the right. context they took when you asked well, for help. Mr. Stewart, I, uh, because even though you were an infantry <coughs> officer and I was an armor officer, I just want to quickly <laughs> ask you, uh, you know how the culture of a chain of command works. Yes, sir. Can you give us a strong assurance based on the numerous people you work through that, in fact, we're dealing in, in fact, a culture of the chain of command or other, did other factors play a part? It was definitely a culture of chain of command. They would, they would do things like, I have to call someone, I'll call you back. It was definitely, they were working their way up the chain of command to find out what the answer was they were supposed to give. You know, at, at some point in time, and it's, and it's the one thing they, they taught all of us in, in officer, officer training, is that when in doubt, make a decision. And, you know, you have to allow first level managers to make decisions about problems that are happening right now on the ground that could affect the health and welfare of people. And they didn't give those people that authority. You know, it would take days sometimes to get an answer from somebody because they were calling probably all the way back to Washington to get an answer before they could tell us, you know, what they were going to do. And, and that's not the way to treat people who are having life-threatening problems. The gentleman's time Thank has expired. Mr. Uh, Mr. Cummings? Before you begin, Mr. Cummings, let me point out, because the question was what the industry had to say, the, uh, uh, the Recreational Vehicle Industry Association submitted for the record a statement, a toxicology report, and in that report, the industry said that the uh, very high levels of formaldehyde were not harmful. I just want to note that, that this, their uh, toxicology report is part of the record. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, uh, first of all, I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here, uh, Mr. Stewart, uh, Mrs. Huckabee, and Mr. Harris. Let me um, say that um, I think it was you, Mr. Stewart, said, that said, I've lost my faith in government. And then you said something that really kind of struck me. You said, in the real world, you're on your own. Well, that's not the way the United States is supposed to be. When our people get in trouble, just like you just said, the nation is supposed to come to their rescue, and you should not be treated like, uh, like you're, you're not a citizen of this country. And, and for that, I think we all have to straighten that out. Uh, to Ms. Huckabee, you said, I do not believe that FEMA set out to do harm. And one of the other things that you said was, what, what, what can I do to stop my children from being sick? Well, the fact is, is that FEMA should have asked the same question. How can they make sure that you and your family is safe? And then to you, Reverend Harris, Mr. Harris, you talked about helplessness and homelessness, uh, hopelessness. And that goes back to the, the line of questioning that just took place of uh, uh, Mr. Ice's questions. I think part of the problem here is that there, and, we, and we've got to keep this in mind, there are a lot of people who are helpless, they feel helpless and they feel hopeless. And they've already come through one storm and they, they, they're just trying to figure out how do they survive from day to day. So rather than complain, they go through the process and then going back to something you said, Ms. Devaney, we've got a situation where they've got children. And I'm telling you, it just, it just I was here shaking my head, the thought that someone would put children in that situation. And I don't care, I don't care who you want to blame for it, whether it's, uh, you, you say it's the top, the bottom. The fact is, is that this should not happen in the United States of America. It should not. We can send people to the moon, damn it. We ought to be able to protect our people and make sure our children are safe. Now, the committee has been over, and again, we've been hearing all this stuff about ventilation. And so I just want to ask a few real quick questions. After receiving the results of this testing, FEMA has repeatedly argued that ventilating is a viable option for addressing high formaldehyde levels. For example, in an official statement released uh, to the public on March 1, 2007, FEMA stated, and I quote, our investigation of formaldehyde and travel trailers indicates that ventilating units can significantly reduce levels of formaldehyde emissions. However, FEMA failed to mention that it achieved these results, how it achieved these results. It tested these trailers with all the windows open, the static vents open, and the ventilation fan on for three straight weeks. The testers never closed the trailer off in any way. Right. Mr. Stewart, 
Would it have been reasonable for you to leave your windows open 24 hours a day? I did. And what happened? It came back at 0.22 parts per million twice the safe, over twice the safe level. And, and I can add that during that time, it was the middle of the winter. We had an, an air purifier in operation when we did our test, all of the windows open and the exhaust vent on. And it was almost four months after we got our camper. So we had been airing the camper out for four months and left it open while we did the test. And it still came back over twice the safe limit. Ms. Huckabee, does testing the trailers under the conditions provide you with any comfort? In other words, the testing that I just said? Um, no. <laughs> and Mr. Harris, when you leave your trailer to go to work, to take your family somewhere, do you, you have to lock it up and close the windows? You have to lock up your place because it's, it's where your valuables are. And uh, I might add this to that. <clears throat> when they tell you to air out the trailer, I don't really know what air out means now. What does air out really mean? Because when you come back, it's, it's believe me, it's terrible. So in other words, if you leave the windows mm -hmm. open and come back, what happens? I mean, you still got a problem? You still have a problem. It's, it's, if you go in there, your eyes are going to burn, your eyes are going to water, and you're going to start coughing. You'll know. We didn't know what it was at first. I know I didn't. I had no idea it was formaldehyde. Mr. Devaney, you wanted to say something? I do. I'd like um, the members of this committee to understand that even though they keep hearing formaldehyde levels will go away, they'll get better and better. In fact, Ball State University did a study of formaldehyde and formaldehyde emitting particle board and fiber board and plywood, and those studies showed that after four to five years, the levels were still only down to half as much. Four to five years. We have to do something before this. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummings. Uh, uh, Mr. Davis, I'm going to recognize Mr. Souter next, but you wanted to. L let me just, I mean, the question is, you know, whatever the level is, FEMA needs to be customer friendly. When you come, it seemed like they were just more interested in covering their legal liability, keeping it out of the newspapers, and that's the wrong direction for government. And I think all of us on both sides of this, uh, you know, hearing your stories, that's not the way that we want government to act. Absolutely. Mr. Souter. When you get it. Uh, when, yeah, Mr. Souter. I thank the chairman and I am uh, want to make clear from the outset that my district makes trailers between 58 percent and 67 percent of all RVs and uh, trailers are made in, in my district. Uh, tens of thousands of people, jobs are dependent on facts, not just talking. You all have had a terrible experience. FEMA did not appear to be responsive. To the degree it was formaldehyde, it should be addressed and there should have been a response to it. But it's important not just to have a hanging without even any scientific facts on the table here. I'm sorry. There were uh, 120,000 trailers that went to your area. They did not all come and were not all manufactured for this. FEMA went to dealers, FEMA went to all sorts of, of different types of things in my travels down to New Orleans and, and that region. You can see different types of trailers at different places, different types of, of brands at different places that um, you can't hang an industry based on the lack of, you have one case where they checked it, we have some individuals. Uh, uh, testimony, we have some other individuals, we have 177 formaldehyde complaints out of 120,000, 177. A sweeping statement saying, oh, people are afraid to complain doesn't cut it here. There needs to be actual research and checking and measurement. Furthermore, all sorts of numbers are being thrown out as far as what type, uh, what is acceptable. It's 0.4 by HUD. It's 0.1 by EPA. Uh, there are all sorts of, and by the way, we don't even have an expert on this panel. Dr. Needle is a pediatrician. He hasn't done research uh, papers on this. He hasn't studied this issue. He has the cases that are in front of him. He's doing the best that he can deal with as a doctor. Another person is a consultant here. They aren't an expert in the field. We have nobody here who actually knows anything much about formaldehyde or the industry. What we have are terrible personal stories that should have been treated. The government should have responded. Now, there's some fundamental questions here that uh, was there 
a difference in the normal process? Are these all made by the same type of company? Is there some kind of structural thing? How does it interact in your region? Why haven't we had these problems in your region before with these type of things? Clearly campers are not intended to be lived in. Why did FEMA let you live in a trailer that are basically for people to go camping in for short periods of time and who are outdoors heavily in that period? They're not meant to be live-in units and yet some of them are still down there uh, being lived in, in in a way that these things were never built to do. Furthermore, we have 10,000 of these things sitting in Arkansas. In Arkansas, we better make sure that if any of those are resold, that, that are rebuilt, that they have a great big made for FEMA because the standard for the ones who were making it was a different standard even than normal HUD standards were to get them done because you were in a panic down there. We had every trailer that's made in Indiana that's shipped out basically is pre-sold. So when the, they went and bought these off dealers' lots, they had to backfill that. The standards that they would have there would be different than the standards that would be sold generally. Generally not formaldehyde, that's a point four. Furthermore, the workers in the plant have a point seven five. And these are checked and monitored on a regular basis. So one of the other questions is, is, was there something that happened in the speed of these that went out combined with the climate that somehow changed even what normally would be in that, that market? There's no evidence at all that the, that the individuals who made these things were impacted any differently. There's no evidence that coming out of the plants they were any different. That how did this, it, it, to the degree we do find that there are a number of these at, at 75 times, if that, that's the case, um, other than just the one example, if that's the case, how did that happen? Because uh, other inspections were occurring as it went on. What's the interaction? What's the time? But clearly, the current FEMA trailers that are in Arkansas should not go on market until this is further researched. Secondly, we need to know whether this is universal. Uh, we also need to know whether people who are getting sick, this, as, as Dr. Uh, Neal did say, the um, the symptoms for formaldehyde are similar to many other symptoms that come through in this particular climate, including water contamination, including uh, stress can, can combine with the extra pollution that's in the city, to just uniformly, without research, make the assertions that I've been hearing today about an industry is irresponsibility. We need to respond and help individuals when they're sick. The insensitivity out of the government to responding, whatever it was, you should have been moved out of that housing. That's not the question. But to, to slander and make assertions in this committee without facts is, is really unfortunate. Yield back. Did you uh, have any of those questions you wanted responded to, Mr. Senator? I, I could respond. Uh, Mr. To a number of the statements that he made. Well, Sir, first, first let me say for the, for the record that I live in a camper. I bought my own camper. I'm not here today to degrade the camper industry. I live in one. Okay? It is the way the campers were made and manufactured. There's no evidence of that, sir. Okay. There, the, 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 it, there's no evidence that the, that that that's what we need to look at as to because it, you, what you're saying may in fact be true that particularly with certain type of reactions in individuals there was not enough sensitivity or warning that said to, to do that but you cannot say on the record based even on one case that it's the way they were made you say I think it's the way they were made in my case okay um, anybody who has been in a FEMA camper anybody who has been in numerous FEMA campers and I've been in a number of FEMA campers, not just one, but many, okay? The walls are literally falling down in many of these campers. This is not, these campers were not manufactured like a regular camper, okay? The industry threw these together and delivered them for a reason. So as, as they sit today, the FEMA campers <coughs> were put together in a shoddy fashion. They were n they're not nearly as sturdy as a regular camper, and whether the materials in them are substandard or not, I know that the ones I took apart, because I took a lot of the material out of mine, the material was not up to, up to grade. There are a lot of things with that. And just to answer your question on the industry workers, if you watch the report by Dan Rather, who interviewed the industry workers who put those campers together, many of them are indeed sick. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for calling this hearing. You know, every time I'm involved in a discussion or a hearing relative to FEMA, uh, there are new revelations which 
seem to take this agency to a new level of low. It's hard for me to imagine that any agency, that any business, any unit of government could operate with such a high level of incompetence, such a low level of sensitivity, and obviously a level of not being prepared. Mr. Devaney, could I ask if you would turn to Exhibit Q in your briefing materials? Uh, there is an internal FEMA email from July 26, 2006. It references what FEMA staff apparently call the sniff test. As you can see, the subject line on this email is formaldehyde issues. It is a one-sentence email that reads, can you send someone to check this out to simply do a sniff test and determine the needs for a different unit. There are other FEMA documents that refer to the sniff tests. This is apparently the process by which FEMA determines if someone can exchange a trailer based upon high formaldehyde levels. A FEMA employee or contractor visits the trailer and sees if he can sniff the smell of formaldehyde. If so, FEMA may swap out the trailer. Mr. Vaney, my question is, can you tell us if this approach makes sense? Can a person from your experiences, from your training, from your level of expertise, can a person reliably determine if a trailer is safe by simply sniffing for formaldehyde? Yes, I can address that question. First of all, I'd like, I'd like you to understand that we can't even smell formaldehyde until the concentration is already, on average, 0.83 percent. So that means 50 percent of people, even at 0.83 percent, still can't smell it. Only about half the population can, because that's the average. So the, the formaldehyde level typically is close to one part per million before you even are aware definitively, oh, that's formaldehyde. Second of all, so we can't depend on our noses, because once we can smell formaldehyde, we're being way overexposed. People in the workplace know this too. Second of all, the reference to a sniff test most likely is in reference to a direct reading instrument, a photo ionization reading instrument that you turn on outside, calibrate it in fresh air, and then take it inside, and it reads almost instantaneously a formaldehyde level. That's one possibility, that, and those are called sniffers, and that's the possibility of an instrument they might be referring to if, if in good faith they were using instrumentation. They also could have used what's called um, a detector tube where they pull a known quantity of air through a chemically treated tube that changes colors, and we know from the concentration of change in color on the tube and the volume of air what the concentration of formaldehyde would be in the air. Those are called direct reading detector tubes, and they take just five minutes to use. They might have done that too if we want to interpret this in good faith and think they actually used instrumentation and did not depend on their noses. I would not like to think anybody really did depend on their nose. Well, in developing protocols or methods of operation, would one be accurate to assume that FEMA had access to this type of information? You know, I mean, that there were people working for FEMA, or they knew how to get the information that would, would tell yeah. them how to respond to certain situations? This is certainly not uh, common knowledge for um, a lay person to know about. FEMA would have to have specialists, industrial hygienists, environmental health engineers like myself who understand this kind of instrumentation and how to do proper sampling for various airborne contaminants. And Whether FEMA does or not, I, I have no knowledge of. But they would have had access to resources that could have allowed them to have this kind of expertise available well, especially if they were working in, in association with the EPA experts who did the air sampling later. 
Thank you very much. I see that my time is expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Platt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't have a question, but one is just a word of thanks to you, Mr. Chairman, and the ranking member and staff for uh, holding this very important oversight hearing, and, and to the witnesses to thank them for their testimony, and especially to the uh, three witnesses whose families have been impacted. Um, I appreciate my colleague's opinion that uh, we need to base our statements and, and efforts and actions on fact, but your testimonies are fact. The experiences that you've had in these trailers is a factual experience. Um, and each of you have presented your experiences very well. And, and that's going to be very helpful to this committee as we go forward and try to get to the bottom of, of this issue that should have gotten to the bottom of a long time ago. I mean, the, the fact, the, the um, unexcusable response of FEMA in trying uh, how it responded to your and others' inquiries asking for assistance and your own individual efforts to get to the bottom of it. Um, you, you shouldn't have had to have done that. So uh, we appreciate your efforts and, um, you know, as a parent, um, to, uh, Ms. Huckabee, um, sometimes as a parent you just know uh, what the cause of a problem is even if you can't right, right. exactly right. prove it, but you just know. Uh, and each of you um, should be commended be, for being willing to come forward uh, and through your personal efforts, not just uh, to have um, a result for yourselves, but for the greater good um, and looking out for others. And, and I'm not sure with all of you, but I, I know, uh, Mr. Stewart, you referenced uh, your past service in uniform, both uh, um, with uh, law enforcement as well as in the military, and, and we're grateful for that service. And, and uh, yet again, serving your fellow citizens here today as well as with your fellow witnesses. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Platts. Um, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the witnesses. I'm sorry that our skeptical colleague uh, is no longer able to be with us, Mr. Souter, because uh, I thought he raised some interesting uh, questions. We certainly want to get all the evidence but I haven't seen this level of government incompetence outside of the nation of China. You know, when I first heard about this, contaminated living conditions, consumer products, things like that, uh, uncaring government, that's what first sprang to my mind. And they executed an official in China for not having done their job. Now, no one is asking for that here, but how about a simple application of the golden rule. The golden rule for an agency that when my wife's from the Gulf Coast, she survived Hurricane Camille. President Nixon's administration supplied a trailer. They lived in it for a year. It was a great experience. Everything worked. All we are asking for is for government to work just as well 40 years later. So perhaps our Republican colleagues will want to join us and having government work as well as it did in the Nixon administration. That's not too high a goal. <laughs> but, but let's apply the golden rule. If you'd put Exhibit B up on the monitor, the one home that FEMA apparently did test with living occupants, uh, the Cistrunks on April 6, 2006, these were the levels in their manufactured housing unit over an eight-hour period. Right side of the master bed, 1.2 parts per million. Now, we'll disregard the inside the cabinet reading because, granted, that's probably going to be too high. Nobody lives inside a cabinet. But this other reading I found particularly touching. Bunk bed in small bedroom, 1.2 parts per million. Well, who sleeps in bunk beds in small bedrooms? Your child. Kids. Our precious children. Yeah. And you know, I'd feel a lot better about the skeptics if they could identify for me one high federal FEMA official or one high industry executive who put their kid in a small bunk bed under these conditions. Then I would feel like the golden rule had been applied and we were doing unto others as they were doing unto us. 
But I haven't been able to identify that FEMA official. Maybe he or she is about to testify at a later panel. I haven't been able to identify that industry executive that is adhering to that simple, common sense, back home standard. So that's what really worries me about this. The people of the Gulf Coast are fine people. They've been through incredible hardship. And for them to face not only Hurricane Katrina and Rita, but Hurricane FEMA, <laughs> which may stand for failed every major assignment. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the rank and file folks because they seem to have showed amazing common sense. When the field people report problems and their lawyers higher up say, don't test at this time because then you'd have to deal with the results. And this is quoting from an email that was sent by a gentleman um, on June 15, 2006. Do not initiate any testing until we give the okay. The reasoning for that was once you get the results and should they indicate some problem, the clock is running on our duty to respond to them. Well, the clock is running any time there's a small child in a bunk bed in any one of these units breathing this terrible stuff. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm proud of you for holding this hearing. This is long overdue. We've got to clean up FEMA. We've got to help the people on the Gulf Coast and all the areas of danger in our country. And I'm tired of some of our colleagues making excuses for government and these industry folks until they show us that the golden rule has been applied. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Ms. Uh, Fox. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let, let me just say nobody's apologizing here. I think we've been very clear government didn't respond here and is responsible. And I, when you say Republicans, uh, you, I hope you're not talking about the ranking member and others who have been very critical of FEMA here. If we really want to go back to low standards, we can go back to the Carter administration. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of blame to go by. But we try to keep this hearing on the up and up, and I appreciate the gentleman's comment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I also am not apologizing for anyone uh, in the federal government, or particularly not in FEMA. I, I'm sorry that my colleague from Indiana left, because I will tell you all something that you don't know, and then not, you'd have no way of knowing. But the night before we had the, the vote to appropriate $52 billion for hurricane relief for Katrina, we raised a lot of the issues he did, I did, and a couple of other members about the use of trailers because we saw in the plan the, the number of trailers that were going to be purchased. We questioned uh, the, how quickly those trailers would be available, where they would be used, how would the community absorb them. A lot of questions came up about this and we were not given very satisfactory answers. So you will not find me to be an apologist for the administration or FEMA in this area. I voted against the Katrina funding with $52 billion at one time because I said there was no accountability, there was no plan, we were doing this too quickly. And I think that is a major problem that we have in our government. I do, though, appreciate my colleagues also mentioning that we need to have a balanced hearing what I, I'm very sympathetic with all of you all for having problems, and I think, Mr. Stewart, very few of us have experienced what you described, coming home and having everything gone, and that has to be so devastating. But what we need to do is we need to use your feedback to us as a way to fix the system, and we're not doing enough of that in this committee. That troubles me. My constituents come to me and tell me about problems, and I go out there and try to solve those problems. I look for how to make systemic change. That's why I got on this committee, because I want to see systemic change. I don't care whether it's a Democratic administration or Republican administration. Government employees are there to serve you. That is my attitude. That's the attitude of my staff, and it should be the attitude of every person who works for any level of government. And I want to mention that a couple weeks ago we had a, a bill here, H.R. 404, and I raised the issue about that bill sounded great, but it accomplishes nothing. Representative Cuellar came to me and said, let's try to make this better. And we've been working on that bill to set standards for customer approval, customer appreciation. What's lacking in that bill 
is what Representative Cooper talked about, establishing responsibility and accountability and consequences. It is unconscionable to me that you would call a FEMA employee and not get the kind of response you should get. If you're telling them you have problems, they should solve that problem. That's their goal. You're not a problem to them. You're the reason they're there. But it just points out so many parts of our government are dysfunctional. We have too large a federal government. We cannot do these things at the federal level. FEMA should be a coordinating agency, in my opinion, and most of the work should be done at the state and local levels. We are taking the power away from the people who can do the work and putting it in the hands of people who simply are not on the ground and don't know how to do it. And as far as the quality of the trailers or the campers is concerned, I think we definitely should look into that and make sure we don't ever have these kinds of substandard things done if they were. But I do agree with uh, Congressman Souter. We need to know all the facts. We need to know the proportion. And we need to find out why, if there was a really bad unit made, what caused that to happen and why that won't happen again. Again, getting to the systems is what we need to be doing so that the people are served better. And I hope this committee, Mr. Chairman, will start taking a broader view instead of just the sensational things. And again, what you experience is very personal and very tragic, but it's meant to sensationalize. That doesn't accomplish a lot except to raise our awareness and it only accomplishes something if we follow up on it in a systematic way. And that's what I'd like to see happen. And I thank you for at least giving constituents this opportunity because I listen to my constituents and then I work on what they talk to me about. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to point out to the gentlelady that I knew from my own experience what a good job FEMA could do. When we had an earthquake in California, FEMA was right there. They helped. Uh, people were grateful. And we, uh, we, we, we recognize that. Uh, we want to improve the FEMA operation, but we've got to identify problems, not just uh, uh, accept the fact that they can't be uh, resolved. M Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, Mr. Harris. May I reply to Ms. Fox? And, That's and okay uh, with her. you can share this with the uh, Congressman as well. I must say this. When you're in a dilemma, and you're needing answers. When you're dealing with FEMA, I'm not talking about conjecture or a parable or a story. I'm telling you what happened. These are not imaginary things. And when you deal with FEMA, after you've lost everything you have, they do not respond or they have not responded in a way that you would think would be equitable when you're in a situation. And I can identify with Mr. Stewart and Ms. Huckabee. When you talk to them, there is no sense that there's something that's gonna be answered or handled. So as far as sensationalizing, I don't know about that. Uh, as far as it being Republican or Democrat, when I call FEMA, I don't tell them what party I am. I'm just trying to get <laughs> some help. And what I think in my lowly position is that they have not been able to remedy us. When we called, I don't know, I don't want to speak for them, but when I called, I feel just as confused after I called as when I did because I don't know what to do. Mr. Chairman, yes. could I make one quick yes, comment? Yes, one, one quick what, one, we have well to move my, on. What my position is, you should be able to write down the name of that person that you are not getting an answer from and have some place you can go to and get a response and get feedback. And they know that if they don't treat you right, there will be consequences. That's the problem with our system now. There are no consequences for bad performance on the part of federal employees. There are many wonderful federal employees who work hard to do their jobs, but when you're not being treated right, you should have some mechanism for alerting people to that. Gentle, gentle lady's time has expired. Uh, I want to recognize my colleague from California, but one of the consequences is they've got to come here before the Congress. And you may call it sensationalizing, but we're going to 
make people answer through oversight for the, the lack of due diligence and responsible actions. Uh, Ms. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for your ability over the years to bring truth and speak truth to power. Sensationalizing, let me sensationalize it even more. I was a member of the, United, uh, the California State Senate. I had moved into a new office. They came in and gave me new carpeting. They put it down with glue. <laughs> they painted my walls and they brought in naugahyde furniture. I became violently ill. I went to doctors in Sacramento, in Los Angeles, wherever I could. I spent thousands of dollars of my own money, not government money, my own money, to find why my eyes were tearing and red, my nose was running, my face was swollen, a terrible odor was coming up, my stomach cramped. This happened over a period of months. I find, and I had all kinds of skin tests. I found out I was allergic to something called formaldehyde. Are you aware that glue that sticks carpet and tile has formaldehyde in it? So the construction of probably the trailer had formaldehyde in the glue that held component parts together. It wasn't until a doctor sent a team in to test the air and all. They wrote me a six-page letter, single-spaced. I had to take it to the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee said I could have my office redone because it takes two and a half years for formaldehyde to gas out. Two and a half years. And as long as that substance is there in the building uh, component parts, you are breathing it in. It will definitely affect your entire system because it goes up into your T-zone. It affects your brain. It affects your concentration. It starts to destroy the meninges of the brain. That's that thin skin. It could eventually kill you. So if I haven't sensationalized it enough, I will bring the letter and submit it to the chair's evidence. I have not seen a department so incompetent as the Federal Emergency Management Department has been in the last six years. I watched like the world did the response to Katrina. It was shameful. So I want to apologize to you and for my colleagues who are saying we don't have a statistical base, we only need one. We don't need thousands. And when I read an email, like I'm going to share with you right now, and this is something that went to FEMA, and this is the response from one employee. I received guidance from our IA policy group at HQ, I imagine that's headquarters. According to HQ, there are no health concerns associated with the formaldehyde <laughs> inside our FEMA MH slash TT. Those are trailers. We were given instructions to turn on the heater for an hour, then turn off the air and open all the windows and turn on the air for 48 hours. This will eliminate the smell. It will not eliminate the cause that is sickening the people who live there because the formaldehyde is in the materials that hold the unit together. If you have any questions or concerns, feel, feel free to contact me. Now, that is denying that these trailers are emitting a substance that really takes two and a half years
to gas out. This is a scientific fact. So you coming, speaking truth to power, and we're the power. I want to commend you for that. You cannot deny what is true. FEMA has failed us. I argued long and loud not to put FEMA under Homeland Security. You have too many levels of bureaucracy. So, Brownie, you have done a good job. Just let you know that it's cronyism and incompetence that has put us in this situation. I apologize to all of you for the failure of our government. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Chairman. I, I, I see we have another panel, and I'm, I'm fine this time. I'd, I'd be happy to yield to uh, Representative Jindal. I thank my colleague for yielding. I also want to thank the Chairman and Ranking Member for holding this hearing. First of all, I want to echo my colleague's comments, especially to our two residents that had to live in these trailers. You deserved to be treated better. Nobody can excuse what you had to endure. I've often said it was almost like there were three disasters. There were the storms in Louisiana, there was the breaking of the levees, and then third, there's been the bureaucratic response. I wish I could tell my colleagues I believe these to be isolated cases. We know personally these aren't isolated cases. We've gotten dozens of calls in our offices. We share the same frustration as the witnesses we're hearing from today. When we called to seek better treatment, whether it was replacement trailers, alternative housing arrangements, we literally had a constituent who had one lung was living in a trailer, decided to move back in their moldy apartment, thinking that was safer for them than the formaldehyde in their trailer. There is absolutely no excuse for how these witnesses and the others that can't be here have been treated. Let's be clear about that, no excuse. I've got a, a couple of questions, but I want the witnesses, especially the two gentlemen that have had to live, had, had to endure through this to know there's no excuse for the way you've been treated. Uh, you said it exactly right, sir. You are an American citizen. You are a taxpayer. It wasn't your fault these storms took away everything you owned. There was no excuse for you to have to be a victim of your own government's incompetence. Mr. Mr. Stewart, I, I'll, you know, again, and, and please take your time. I've got just really two questions, one for you and then one for, for Dr. Needle as well. Mr. Stewart, you, you indicated that you made several calls to FEMA to complain about the conditions in your trailer. You reported them that the results from the American Chemical Sensors Kit that, you, that showed the elevated levels of formaldehyde. You complained that FEMA still would do nothing to address this issue. They refused to help. You know, later we're going to hear testimony today from FEMA. We're going to hear testimony from FEMA that they immediately responded upon receiving complaints. I know for a fact that's not true. I know we didn't have success in getting responses from many of our constituents, even after they brought medical documentation, even after they were able to prove they or their children were suffering due to these elevated levels of formaldehyde. And when we did get a response, when we did get a response, so often the response was something as ridiculous as, well, open the windows, run the AC as if that was going to solve the problems in these trailers, especially when you saw formaldehyde levels higher than what would be acceptable for workers if this was OSHA higher than what was acceptable for FEMA's own inspectors, how in the world could they expect you and your family, you and your wife, how could they expect other families, how could they expect children to simply just open the windows and not worry about it? It is a leading question, but I still want to give you a chance to respond. According to the best of your recollection, I want you to have a chance, because we are going to hear later today from FEMA that they, they responded quickly to every complaint. We know that's not true. I want, to the best of your recollection, after you complained to FEMA, how long did it take for you to get a response? Did you ever actually even get a, an adequate response? We've heard from your testimony what happened, but I certainly don't think it was proper that you had to use your own reinsurance money instead of rebuilding your home to in, in other, in, instead have to provide yourself with temporary safe housing. But after you complained, how long did it take and did you ever get an adequate response? <clears throat> um, it, first of all, it's not really a leading question, but no, I did not ever receive an adequate response. If I had, I wouldn't have had to buy my own camper. I think that can speak for itself. Um, I can also say that if, if you want proof positive that FEMA did, failed to react, why is it that a citizen has to tell FEMA, listen, first of all, there's an OSHA study out there that says these, these campers are contaminated, number one. Number two, why does a citizen have to go out and seek out assistance from a chemical sensor company in the United States? to send me a free sensor 
so that I can test my own camper. I tested my camper because FEMA would not. And I took it upon myself to do the research and the work that FEMA should have done in the first place. So for FEMA to ever try and say they didn't, you know, they reacted quickly, you know, when I complained, I, I, I don't know how they, anybody can possibly say that. Because there's nobody in this room that would, would go to the extent I went to without having to be forced to do so. If FEMA had said, we're on our way out with someone to test your camper, I would have been more than glad to let them in and test it and, and we would have been on our way. And even after that, I gave FEMA chance after chance. I actually told FEMA before I ever went through this process, I'm going to test my camper and I'm going to tell you what the results are, which I did. I called them and I said, here are the results. They still refuse to act. At that point, I even told them, listen, this camper is, is toxic. One, I want a new camper. And two, I want to know how you're going to go about testing other campers in the community because I can't be the only one. And there are tens of thousands of my friends living out there in these campers and I want to make sure they're safe. And if you don't do that, I am going to do everything I can to publicize this issue because the people have to know what's going on. So either you fix it or I'm going to do what I can to fix it. I, gave, I, I tried as hard as I could to get FEMA to react and they failed to, they just knowingly failed to respond. Well, Mr. Stewart, I hope if your time allows, I hope you'll wait and listen to the testimony in the second panel because when we hear, as a, as a, con a congressional committee, when we hear that when FEMA comes and tells us they did respond quickly to every case, I want you to be, if your time allows, I'd like you to be here present to hear that. I'd like to thank both the witnesses. You represent so many other people that can't be here today from the Gulf Coast that shouldn't have not, should not have had to endure this. There was a woman in Baton Rouge who has now died. They haven't yet proven that her cancer was related to the formaldehyde, but many families have complained they had asthma, they had respiratory problems, they had, they had prolonged exposure to a carcinogen, and instead of getting prompt attention to their complaints, they were met with stone walls, they were, they were met with frustration, they were, they were denied any help, and many times they were told their health claims simply weren't real, even though they saw what was happening to them and to their children. Mr. Chairman, I think I've exhausted my time. I've got a second question. I'll save it if we have another round of questions. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I also would like to um, join in this joint apology or collective apology to the three of you. Um, this is unconscionable, and uh, this is one of the reasons that I think I and many others of the freshman class ran for uh, office to uh, try to deal with the type of uh, inefficiencies and uh, abuses in government uh, that we've seen. I'd also like to respond to something that Mr. Souter said, and I understand his sensitivity, but I read the whole hearing a little bit differently. I, I'm willing to stipulate that the industry has a pretty good record of providing safe products, and I think it's simply the fact that this appears to be such an aberration that it would call into question why FEMA didn't look at even if it were only 58 cases, we know it's more than that, and say, wait a minute, there's something very wrong here because these, how, these manufactured homes should not be this way. I think it's, the, it's specifically because this is so unusual that FEMA should have, uh, that have been red, had red flags all over the place and taken action. Uh, but I want to get to the issue with you as to maybe how widespread these incidents were, and, and I know when the committee announced that it was holding hearings, we heard from a number of uh, organizations that have been dealing with the, this issue. One of them uh, called Alabama Arise, and uh, a man named Zach Carter, who's an organizer there, submitted some written testimony to the committee because he couldn't appear. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to make that a part of the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. And he stated uh, in his written testimony, I have met and video interviewed dozens of Katrina victims in South Mobile County, and I can say that almost each one has complained to me about health problems that they have developed since moving into their FEMA camper, from nosebleeds and bronchitis to high blood pressure. Uh, David Underhill of uh, Mobile Bay Sierra Clubs has informed us that almost, ha almost all of the a uh, dozen FEMA campers that that organization tested had had problems with formaldehyde. Uh, we've had testimony from uh, um, many, many people. So I'm interested in knowing about it, particularly with the three of you, and I'm not familiar with the, the setting in which you live, but I assume that you lived in an area where there were many people 
in similar circumstances living in FEMA supplied campers. Did you have conversations with these people uh, that, to share their experiences? Would you elaborate on those for us? Um, sir, immediately after my test results came out and were publicized, I was contacted by the Sierra Club and took part in assisting them in testing campers in Bay Village, which is a FEMA trailer park in, in Bay St. Louis. And I'll tell you two things that, that were shocking. Number one were the, the number of trailers that tested with excessively high formaldehyde. 88% of all the campers that were tested had formaldehyde levels that were, were deemed unhealthy. And, and the second, and almost a scary thing, is that when we walked in and asked these people, you know, this is who we are, this is who I am, I tested my camper, my camper was high, can we hang a test kit in your camper to make sure that what you're living in is safe? And almost unanimously, the first response was, as long as it's okay with FEMA, because I don't want to lose this house, because if I lose it, I'm going to be living back on my slab. And the, the fear of, of FEMA was so strong that people would rather live in an unhealthy environment than to be back on the street, because they feared FEMA would come in and snatch that house right off from underneath them. And even when I actually put, when, when the first media event happened, and I, and I had you know, publicized what happened to me, the reporter who did the report, he was living in a FEMA camper too. And we actually joked back and forth because we had already heard of FEMA coming in heavy handed and taking campers away from people. And we actually contemplated, you know, what, what happens if this thing goes out? You may lose your house too because he was living in a FEMA camper. Mm -hmm. Th there is a, there is a deep rooted fear of people living in these things that those tactics, uh, are, someone's going to come in and snatch up their mm -hmm. house. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, Right, I just have a few seconds left, so I'd like to, uh, Mrs. Huckabee and, and Mr. Harris to comment if also about their experiences. If you had I conversations too, with others who did I faces. too at school meetings and at, you know, play dates and things like that, you know, conversation would come up about somebody not being there because their child was sick again and again and again and it was the same type stuff, asthma symptoms. I cannot count the number of people I know that have had children born since the storm and they all have asthma. It used to be something where, you know, every once in a while you'd hear of somebody but I think almost literally every friend that I have that's had a child born since the storm, they have turned asthmatic and they're all in the FEMA trailers. I would just like to quickly echo and say yes. Um, uh, as a minister, um, what we try to do is, is help people during the times that they're feeling uh, very vulnerable and times that they're feeling uh, inadequate. And I want to tell you that there are there are trailer parks uh, and other areas where people are suffering. And I must say again to you, please hear me. It's not an imagined thing th that what Mr. Stewart is saying. There is a fear. There is a, an element that they make you feel like you ought to be glad you got this. I, I, uh, uh, Congressman, I can't overemphasize that. So when we're saying this to you, please hear me. It, it <sighs> Thank you. We hear you very loud. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Yarmouth. Uh, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by first thanking all the witnesses. I really appreciate you taking time to come and to share with us. And let me say right from the outset, uh, you know, I have enough proof the fact that you're here and you've indicated in terms of your views and you talked about the children and your sick children and the problems that you've encountered, that's enough proof for me. And of course, um, I come from New York and uh, I know about 911 and, uh, and I remember even with EPA when they indicated the fact that there's no problem and then now all of a sudden people having respiratory problems and, uh, uh, and now people saying, well, I think maybe uh, something did occur. Well, I think that uh, uh, your coming and sharing with us, you know, uh, is something that we need to get on top of, you know, uh, right away. Because uh, I, I must say, uh, here we go again. And to think about the fact that the lawyers, you know, um, uh, uh, basically said no testing until you uh, contact us. I mean, that to me sort of smells like a cover-up. And I think that uh, we cannot afford to uh, uh, have cover-up. And then one of my colleagues on the, um, uh, on the committee here, 
you know, went on to say, well, you know, no proof. But people are afraid to complain. That's normal. I mean, if you're dealing with a big government agency and uh, you, they're saying that we're going to give you this even though it's not right, you still don't want to complain about it. A lot of people fall into that category. And a lot of people will suffer before they will actually uh, complain. Uh, but the point of the matter is, is that um, uh, 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 I'm concerned because you said that FEMA was treating them like a, ch a charity case. Well, uh, that to me uh, is very troubling uh, because when you have a family member uh, that's suffering, you suffering, and you know a lot of your friends are suffering, and you're trying to do something about it. I think uh, Reverend Harris mentioned, he says, you know, uh, uh, we're helpless, but we're not hopeless. But at the point, some people begin to get become hopeless, and they just feel that nothing can be done. Nobody cares about, you know, uh, 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 the situation. And I think that uh, you coming here and sharing with us, indicating the fact that how people's eyes are burning and how they're tearing, you know, and, and for us to hear in an open way that FEMA's priorities seem to have been upside down. They were more concerned about protecting themselves, protecting their image, rather than protecting the people. And that is the thing that I think that uh, is coming across very loud and, and clear to me. I do have um, uh, one question I would probably want to ask you, uh, uh, Dr. Needle. Um, will you please uh, turn to, I think, Exhibit K? And uh, there's an email exchange between FEMA and the Gulfstream coach discussing the trailer occupant. And it says, if you, you turn to the bottom of page seven, you'll see an email that says, the employees after interviewing a trailer op occupant, it reads, he has been experiencing numerous respiratory problems. Upon advice from his doctor, that's the applicant talking, or occupant of the trailer, is requesting the manufacturer's safety data sheets in regards to types of solvents, glues, or adhesives used in manufacturing the tra trailer. The applicant states that the trailer stinks like formaldehyde. Now if you turn to page three in the middle of the page, a FEMA lawyer responds and says, the program should not be dealing with applicants on the formaldehyde issue without first coordinating with lawyers of FEMA and the Department of Justice. Uh, if, and FEMA's field employee responds in the middle of the page. He says, okay, if I interpret this correctly, we are at all, we are at all stop on providing material safety data sheets to requesters. You know, doesn't that seem to be a cover up? Um, I don't know if I can speak directly to that. Um, well, let me put it this way. But, um, Do yes. Dr. Neal, in the case of a doctor has advised his patient to try to learn what chemicals might be causing his respiratory problem, do you think that's a reasonable request? You can answer that one. Absolutely. Huh. I, I agree that it would be, yes. But FEMA's lawyers see it as their job to prevent information from being conveyed to the trailer occupants. Does that seem to be right to you? I think as the documentation is coming out both from what we know and from also what the committee is, has revealed, has discovered and is relating to us, I think it's becoming clear that uh, FEMA has known about this problem for much longer than at least any of us suspected. I mean, I can tell you, for instance, that you know we on the ground in Mississippi and Louisiana were raising attention about this issue well over a year ago. And at that point, FEMA's spokesperson uh, said that, I I'm paraphrasing, but that basically everything was under control and that there were no health concerns. And what we're finding today is that even at that very time, there were individuals within the agency that felt otherwise. Still sounds like a cover up to me. But anyway, um, uh, my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. And I really thank all of you for coming. And I really, really appreciate you sharing information with us you know, because I, I think that uh, the message is clear. 
and that uh, we want to do whatever we can to try and fix it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Mr. Sarbanes? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for your um, testimony. I want to rebut the notion that government is inherently incompetent and can't do the job, which is the direction you can head in when you hear the kind of testimony that's here. In my view, government's there. It's an instrument to be used for good or bad, and it depends on leadership. And for this kind of thing to happen, you either have to have uncaring leadership or incompetent leadership. There's only two choices. Because if you have leadership that's caring, then the only way something like this happens is if it's incompetent. And if you have leadership that's competent, then the only way this could be allowed to happen is if the leadership is uncaring. So we're probably at the beginning of a process, Mr. Chairman, that's going to continue to bring forth more information, evidence, and we can get to that issue, and we're going to have testimony later. Who's deserved by this? And I, and I, I want to say I, um, I hope you, you don't feel that we're overindulging in the statements that are coming forward here, but I think it reflects um, um, the level of anger on the part of members of this uh, committee. But who's deserved? Well, obviously you're deserved, first and foremost, the people that should have been helped. But in addition, I know that there's, there's FEMA employees, rank and file, people in the field, some of whose expressions of caring have been documented here today, who are going to watch this hearing and are going to say, that's not us. We care, and we do the job in a confident way. But the leadership that's coming from above has either tied our hands or neglected us, and then it spills over and affects you. So they're being disserved. And the third constituency that's being disserved is everybody in this country. Because we keep grasping for examples that we can do things right when we face these challenges, and we keep seeing instances where we're screwing it up. And again, that comes back to leadership. And I want to ask um, you, Mrs. Huckabee, to, to answer this question for me. Or t tell me about those moments in the middle of the night, because I'm sure they, they happen. When you thought to yourself, am I going crazy? Because what I hear is, is common sense. There are no experts. You're the experts. You're there. You're trying to protect your family. You see what's happening. You walk in. You see your daughter covered in blood. And yet, every time you try to penetrate the system and get them to respond, you have, you're the one who has to come away wondering whether there's something wrong with you, whether your assessment is somehow flawed when you see all around you all the evidence that something's going on. So tell me about those moments when you were sitting there saying, am I, am I going crazy? Because I bet they happen. Oh, there are so many of them. I mean, you, you know, my, my daughter woke up in the middle of the night coughing, crying, wheezing my son with the sinus infections over and over again. And I mean, you begin to think, okay, well, if, if FEMA's saying there's nothing wrong with these trailers and there, there's got to be something. I even had one <coughs> FEMA representative on the maintenance line say, are you sure that you're not exaggerating your children's symptoms? And they said that they had people trying to claim they had formaldehyde to get bigger and better trailers and things like that. And I mean, I, I assure you, I even went back, you know, to the pediatrician's office and said, look, can you give me the list of dates that I was here? Just, you know, because it seemed like we were there so often. I wanted to make sure in my own mind, because I thought, you know, surely my kids have not really been there like once a week for the past, you know, 18 months. And I even called the receptionist. I'm like, can you give me the list of dates that I've been there and called and everything? And I mean, it's just terrifying because you know that there are people who, who look at you and go, now, why can't you just, you know, keep your kids healthy? They've got these, you know, 
seemingly apart, you know, simple little things that should be able to be fixed. And it's all five kids over and over and over again. And I mean, of course, you know, outside of the situation, I would look to the mother too and be like, you know, what is she doing wrong? Because kids don't just stay sick like that. Well, it's incredible that you'd be asked if you're exaggerating in a situation because when you're captive like that, the human response is to try to uh, to understate it to yourself because you don't want to be left thinking that you're not doing the right thing uh, for your children. You mentioned that when you said you were hoping for a diagnosis of an allergy so that you would at least not have to face the prospect that you were putting your children in harm's way some, for some other reason. So this is the position that you're being put in and I would just say to all of the, all of the witnesses, um, don't let anyone else be the experts. Don't let anyone else tell you that you're, that you're crazy or that, you're, that you don't understand what's happening in your own ha home and your own, with your own family. Be and, and we are here to respond to, uh, to what you brought forth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, Mr. Murphy, you're next. But before I recognize you, I want to call on uh, Mr. Davis for Thank you. Comment. And let me just pick up for just one second what Mr. Sarbanes observed. I mean, I, I think in this case when you take a look at what everybody's going to say today, and not just, uh, I rarely defend lawyers, but the lawyers from their perspective were doing their job in protecting the agency. The people in the field were saying we have a problem and sending it up the chain of command and it just kind of all got garbled. Everybody's doing their job and nothing happens. And we can all sit here and agree that the end result was not the result that we want. They weren't taking care of the people. They forgot the mission, that the duty ultimately isn't to the agency, it's not to the bureaucracy, it's to the people they serve. But very rarely do you get rewarded for stepping outside that model and you know, stepping over the rules and the regulations or getting outside your assigned place to do that. That starts at the top. Uh, we can legislate all we want, uh, but at the, at the end of the day it goes with the leadership and the mission in this case with a crisis there after the hurricane was to serve the people. People were doing their jobs, it didn't work and it can't happen. I, that's why your uh, stories here today are so important as we go through. I don't want to point fingers at anybody except we said we had a system that just didn't work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. I just want to comment. The lawyers weren't doing their job. The lawyer's job should have been get in there and clean it up. That's how you avoid liability. I can't imagine how many lawsuits FEMA is now going to face because they try to cover up their failure, their shameful failure to do their job. Mr. Murphy, I want, it's your turn, and uh, I know the witnesses are anxious to <laughs> jump in as well, but uh, I'm going to call on you I mean, next. It's just rarely do I defend lawyers and Henry goes after them, so this is kind of an obvious <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I uh, got to spend a few days in New Orleans a few uh, months ago and um, got to actually spend a little time in w one of the trailers of the resident who's, who's there, who is desperately searching uh, for housing. She was renting before she um, uh, took a trailer. She, uh, that property is no longer available and she has a story uh, like thousands of others who, uh, who are doing everything within their power to get uh, back to uh, normal living, whether rebuilding their house, repurchasing a new house, re-renting uh, again. And so this problem uh, continues um, and may continue for a very long time because it's going to take a long time to rebuild not only the housing stock of the people who, who, who owned houses, but also uh, the thousands of people who rented there who ha have seen um, the prices go through the roof to make some of that rental uh, housing unaffordable, but even if it's still there. Um, I wanted to touch upon some of the testing that actually was done. Um, we've talked a lot about the testing that was not done and the fact that FEMA knew uh, FEMA staff on the ground tried several times to get that testing done. Um, the reports became so prolific that the Sierra Club uh, stepped in to do testing, which resulted in the end in results coming back showing that there were dangerous levels above uh, those recommended by scientific experts. And uh, Mr. Vanny, I wanted to, to point that question to you because I know you were involved with coming up with the protocols that the Sierra Club used uh, and would ask you just to talk a little bit about the advice that you gave them and, um, and how you believe those uh, tests went. I did advise the Sierra Club on methods for testing. And when we, just in general, when we design protocols for doing air sampling, we want to catch actual real values. Um, I think this goes back to what uh, the chairman said, what Mr. Davis said, that 
not only was FEMA trying to cover up, but they engaged other federal agencies in their cover up. They had the EPA design sampling protocols that were, I mean, as an industrial hygienist, bizarre. Why would we take empty trailers, open them and ventilate them 24 hours a day, three weeks straight, and then decide that's how we're going to figure out the formaldehyde levels? And then, in addition to having the EPA design, like I said, bizarre protocols, they got two scientists from the ATSDR, you know, the Agency for Toxic Substances um, Registry, and instead of using their own standard of 0 0.03 parts per million, these scientists chose a level that's so high and causes such physiological damage that it actually at that level, that 0.3 parts per million, it causes the bronchi to constrict enough that it restricts airway enough to cause wheezing, asthma, and uh, an emergency situation. And that level is the one they chose. Instead of using a safe exposure level, the, the ASTDR chose a level of concern. And then, they, and then they analyzed EPA's results using that skewed baseline. Mr. Manning, and I see Dr. Needle shaking your head as well. Do you have any opinion as to why they chose that level despite, you know, a, 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 a number of, uh, of sources of literature suggesting a, a much more reasonable standard? All I can say in my professional opinion is that they did this in order to minimize the actual extent of the problems in these trailers. And I have no other conclusion I can draw. I mean, as a scientist analyzing this, and I have done this all my life. I can't believe it was done. Yeah, I think it was complete violation of our professional code of ethics. Do you have faith in the results of the Sierra Club uh, trials, given your input into how those were conducted? There were some problems there, too. There were, I mean, in an ideal situation, I would have recorded what the, temper the ambient temperatures were, the range during that time, what the humidity levels were, if anyone smoked inside the trailer or not. But by and large, they were realistic samples of what people were being exposed to. They didn't artificially try to elevate them by putting the samples inside cabinets and closing the door. They are pretty realistic, I believe. Mr. Stewart, you had some experience with the Sierra Club trials as, as well. Uh, what was your experience with those, those trials? Um, in, in my circumstance in particular, um, if the test showed anything, it was that the test was actually on the low end because my test was done, as she just stated, you know, not under, you know, perfect conditions. My windows were open, exhaust fan was on, and there was an air purifier, an industrial one, working at the time I did the test. So even at the .22, that was a, that was a low ball figure. Um, so fr from that standpoint, and then, you know, I did walk around and, and put these in other campers, and, and I can say that I don't think there was any, you know, in the middle of the summer in Mississippi that didn't have the air conditioning on and trying to keep the place cool. So from a humidity standpoint and a temperature standpoint, I think they, they were relatively, you know, common throughout, throughout the campers. I did just want to say one thing if I could. I know I'm taking Very up quickly. your time, time, but time to up. Mr. Sarbanes, I just wanted to say one thing. Um, I think that an organization can be uncaring and incompetent at the same time. And I, you know, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I mean, when, when you call FEMA, <clears throat> And one, they don't do anything, and two, they treat you like you're a criminal. I think that's a level of incompetence and uncaring together at the same time. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Your time has expired. <coughs> I want to recognize now uh, our colleague, Mr. Melanson, who is not a member of this committee, but I want to point out that he wasn't a member of the select committee that looking at Hurricane Katrina and all the damage that was done, yet he uh, spent more time at that select committee, put more hours. Uh, and try to do what's right uh, for his constituents, and I want to commend him for that and ask him uh, now to proceed at, at, with his uh, question period. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, also, uh, uh, Ranking Member Davis, uh, who was chairing at that time the Select Committee on Katrina, uh, my only regret is that uh, uh, Chairman Davis's um, leaders uh, put a sunset on the committee uh, at a time when um, we should have been opening up more investigation, but uh, that's in the past. Now we're having to start it anew. You know, the, the people that are here today, uh, Mr. Chairman and other members, um, 
first they were devastated by the storm. I would guess all of them got screwed by their insurance company, excuse the, the rash word. And then the government failed to show up, uh, at least failed to show up in a, a friendly manner to say, I'm here to try and help you. I'm not here to give you anything. I'm here to try and give you a helping hand. And that's what's consistently not happening. Um, you know, the, the gentle lady a while ago talked about the 52 billion and the concern for the delivery. Well, that was in September of 05. And at the end of February of 07, 52 billion still had not been spent and delivered uh, to the sites along the Gulf Coast. And that 52 billion that was spent didn't get to the people that are sitting at this table. Uh, that 52 billion didn't get to the governments to try and put the local governments put the water systems back up or whatever. And you've got entire communities in an area that encompasses about the same size as Great Britain that were affected by two storms. Two of the most horrendous storms this world has seen, uh, not to speak of that this country has seen. Um, you know, we talk about the chain of command and the problem you have, and Mr. Paulson, we're going to have, yeah, I, I visited Mr. Paulson about a, uh, a year ago, I guess it was, with uh, him, Ms. Bustani and I, and I was very excited because I felt like uh, I've got somebody that understands and um, can maybe get this department straight. Um, I'm hoping that the tail didn't start wagging the dog, but we, we'll see where we go there. Uh, one of the things that I've seen or feel that I see is departments of government being run by the attorneys who put the fear of a lawsuit in front of the secretaries and the, the administrators uh, instead of saying, let's figure out how we can get things done and done right for the good of the people and spend the money wisely. Um, yeah, it, it, it's really, really frustrating. Mr. Stewart, uh, a while ago, uh, you made a comment and it, and it hit straight home. One of the things that we argue about here in the Congress is housing for the people that were displaced. Everybody wants to get back home. They want to move their families back home. Yet, what did we do as a government? Every available property that was for rent, and I can t attest to this in New Orleans, was occupied by government contractors or FEMA workers. While the people who wanted to get home, FEMA was trying to put them in trailers and mobile home parks everywhere but where they came from. And it should have been just the opposite. Let those workers commute in to the disaster area to work every day and put the people back where they needed to be. Um, they're still trying to get trailers. Uh, we, we have uh, not only the formaldehyde calls, uh, but we have the problem with getting trailers. There was, I think up in Hope, Arkansas, there's still about 8,000 trailers sitting up there, and they decided that they, uh, when somebody said, well, why do you have all these trailers? Well, we decided we'd uh, save those for the next disaster. Well, there was a tornado through, um, uh, can't remember the name of the town in, in Arkansas, 150 miles away, and the member of Congress from that district basically had to ra raise unmitigated hell to get eight trailers over there to help put people back on the ground in the community so they can start working. Um, that there's, 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 there's no logic to it at all. Um, the chain of command does not exist. I put people in a room from FEMA or ask them to get into a room with local government and contractors or whatever, and they'll find a reason. Usually it's we can't meet with the contract. Well, why the hell not? You know, some, some silly rule, some attorney. When you go to the people I have found, when we find somebody in FEMA that tips over the line and says, let me try and do this because it'll help move you along, they usually are gone within a couple of weeks. The, chain, the turnover and, of course, the excuse is they get weary working down in that disaster area, and so they need to rotate them out. Well, the people are weary, and what they need is some people to stay around there and understand the situation and be as frustrated as them because their government isn't doing anything for them. 
then maybe they'd be hollering, but they're afraid they're going to get fired. And that's what their problem is. Um, Mr. Chairman, I commend you for opening these, these hearings back up. I commend all the chairmen of all the committees and the leadership of this House for opening up what is one of the biggest messes that I've witnessed in my entire life. We still have a chance to get it right. I tell the story, and if I could, real quick before uh, my time's up, I, I know that. I hear a lot of people running around about those people. Um, you know, they're always looking for something. I've got a good friend that's a physician. He's about 63, going on 64 years old. He's very comfortable. He's done quite well in his life. He lost his office, everything in it. His practice is over. Lost the hospital. Thank God his daughter, who had a preemie, demanded the hospital take the baby and evacuate it with her. Otherwise, that baby would have been one of the, the uh, uh, casualties. He lost his house, everything in it. He was gone for the usual three days, come back after the storm. Everything. He raised his children, his family, in that house. His daughter has gone through a divorce, some of which you can pin mostly on the trauma, the, the insurance issues, uh, those kind of things. Uh, they went to tear down their house, demolish it. All the kids, it was like a funeral. Um, as they tore the house down, they got a call that his father-in-law passed away for a heart attack that morning. Now, this is a physician who should recognize that he needs anger management and he is in depression or signs of depression and it is and he he doesn't see it but his friends all see it. And we're dealing with people that have been jerked around for two years, two and a half years. And it's time we stopped it, and the only way, if that's the case, and I'm, I'm going to wrap it up, that that's the case, Mr. Chairman, is by the power of the gavel. I commend you for it, and I hope that you and more members uh, will follow through in these areas so we can get to the bottom of this whole mess. Thank you, and I'm sorry for running over time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mamonson. I appreciate uh, what you had to say, and you're constantly pushing for us to do more. Uh, I want to thank this panel. You've been terrific. You've given us your testimony and you've given it uh, with, uh, with emotion and power and uh, it is a compelling testimony that each and every one of you has given to us. Thank you so much. We're next going to hear from the, um, the head of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, but I want to take a five-minute break and then we will reconvene and go right into Mr. Paulson's testimony. So we stand in recess for five minutes. Please take your seats. We're about to begin. The committee will now hear from R. David Paulison. Mr. Paulison has served as Acting Director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency since 2005. He was confirmed by the Senate as Director in May 2006. Mr. Paulison, we want to welcome you to our committee today and uh, recognize you for your testimony. 
after which we have some questions. There's a button on the base of the mic. Be sure it's pushed in. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it very much. And let me say before I even start uh, that I have heard very, very clearly the reason I sat in this meeting uh, while the witnesses were testifying. I wanted to hear what they had to say and wanted to hear it personally. Uh, and I have heard it very clearly, uh, some other issues. Um, if what they're saying is accurate, particularly with the customer service area, I have a, obviously a lot of work to do in that, in that area and we'll work on that. But we'll also, for these three particular residents, um, we will follow up to make sure that uh, uh, we take care of their issues at hand and find out if there's more. Uh, as administrator of FEMA, I want to assure you and the citizens of our nation uh, that we are aware, we are aware of the concerns regarding the presence of formaldehyde in FEMA travel trailers uh, and are taking responsible steps to address that as we speak. I neglected to swear you away. Okay, and, we start and, all over and, again. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the part you just said, you cannot be held for perjury for having said it. <laughs> but I uh, would like to ask you if you swear and affirm that you will tell us the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Now this part I can be healed, right? <laughs> um, as my uh, uh, written testimony, as you read, um, explains in greater detail, we have been proactive in reviewing the situation. Uh, we have recommended a wide range, wide range of actions that reduce health risk and have been working with the experts to better understand the health environment and investigate additional short and long-term solutions. I wish to make it very clear that the health and safety of residents has been and continues to be our primary concern. Following most disasters, those displaced from housing by disaster are able to obtain or provide or provide with short-term temporary housing just outside the impacted area. Then within a short period, they can return to the homes. With the immensity and size of Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, uh, this simply was not possible. Facing an area of devastation roughly the size of Great Britain, FEMA provided over 120,000 mobile homes and travel trailers to individuals and families throughout the Gulf Coast area. This was the largest emergency housing mission in the history of this nation. Six months after their initial deployment, FEMA received of the first complaint of formaldehyde related orders that we're aware of. After a prompt review, FEMA replaced that unit in just a few weeks on March 19th. Since that time, FEMA has documented just over 200 complaints of strange orders, including what we think is formaldehyde. And of those 200, and not to, not to minimize the issue, but just, to, just for record, uh, we have replaced 58 of those formaldehyde concerns, and five more have been placed into a rental housing sources when they became available. One thing I want to clearly point out, though, whether the number of calls is two or 200, I'm concerned with the potential health implication from aldehyde and our travel trailers and want to better understand and address this very complicated issue. FEMA is working with the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, with EPA, working with HHS, working with HUD, working with Public Health Service, and also the Department of Homeland Security's uh, health Office of Health Affairs, and with industry partners to help investigate the situation. Now we know that FEMA is present in many household products, construction materials, and produced by tobacco smoke and gas cooking. Now although ventilation and other actions reduce the levels, anecdotal experience that we've seen recently, especially from the physicians that you heard from today and those others caring for residents of trailers, has raised questions about the overall indoor quality, uh, air, indoor air quality of travel trailers and the practicality of, ventil of ventilation advice, especially given Gulf Coast region in the summertime. As we've gained experience through this process and more knowledge, we have expanded our efforts to research the levels of formaldehyde in the units and their impact on the health of all of our residents. Despite, despite 30 years of research and reports on numerous federal agencies, there is now no existing consensus on safe formaldehyde levels in residential dwellings. So again, we're looking to the experts for advice. This June, the Department of Homeland, Se Homeland Security officials, including FEMA, again met with CDC the National Center for Environmental Health, the Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, and the National Institute of Standards and Technology. 
Together, we are beginning both short and long-term investigations. In fact, FEMA and CDC are scheduled to ben, begin phase one of the study in the Gulf Coast within the next few weeks. In the meantime, FEMA continues to take action through updated trailer purchase specifications, improving training of FEMA and medical staff who respond to complaints, and continued education and communication with the residents. We have also increased our efforts to move residents out of temporary housing into long -term, longer term housing solutions. FEMA and the de entire Department of Homeland Security are committed to ensuring that victims of disasters are safe and, and have a healthy place to live during the recovery period. The health and safety of the residents is my primary concern. We are going to great lengths to ensure that this, uh, this is the concern of everyone involved in researching and addressing formaldehyde-based issues. We will continue to evaluate, communicate, and mitigate the potential risk of formaldehyde or any other safety issue in our temporary housing units. Together with our federal and private partners, we will work to develop sound best practices for reducing formaldehyde exposure in FEMA provided for in temporary housing. Uh, Mr. Chair, I do want to thank you for this hearing. I look forward to discussing FEMA's recovery efforts with the committee. And as I talked to you earlier, I hope when the, at the end of the day when this is done, uh, this government, perhaps with the help of this committee, can come up with some sound standards that we can apply to not only uh, trail, travel trailers, mobile homes, but all housing units across this country. And again, thank you very much, and I'm willing to answer any of your questions you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Paulison. Uh, without objection, uh, Mr. Davis and I will start off the questioning at uh, 10 minutes each. Uh, I, also, without objection, I wanted to put a couple of documents in the record before I start uh, questioning here. Uh, there is a statement by uh, Paul Nelson, board member, South Bay Communities Association. I would like his uh, testimony to be inserted in the record, as well as testimony by Be Becky Gillette, vice chair of Mississippi Chapter Sierra Club. And without objection, those uh, two documents will be made part of the record. Mr. Uh, Paulison, if I understand your testimony, you, you, you seem to be saying that there is nothing you can do because there is no official standard for formaldehyde. Is that what you are telling us? No, sir, I would not say that at all. I think there are a lot of things that we can do. But I can say that there are no standards to go by, and I hope that we can set those standards with this long-term testing we are going to do. What I am saying is that uh, we have taken the best evidence that we can, the best advice we have so far about airing out trailers, uh, trying to reduce the levels of formaldehyde. We know, we know now that we did not know earlier uh, that that is not going to be sufficient uh, during the summertime, particularly in that Gulf Coast area when the, when the heat is there. You, you can't open the windows and run the air conditioner at the same time. It is simply not going to work. Well, Mr. Paulison, for over a year and a half, displaced residents of the Gulf Coast have been telling FEMA that formaldehyde in their trailers have been making them sick. 120,000 families have stayed in these trailers. There are approximately 76,000 trailers in use in Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas. And despite all this time and the obvious importance of this issue, the documents that you provided to our committee indicate that FEMA has only tested one occupied trailer, and that is a trailer in Baxterville, Mississippi. And it belonged to a pregnant woman, Dawn Sistrunk, and her husband, Carlton Sistrunk. They had a four month old child, and the trailer was tested only because of their unusual persistence. Uh, I want to show you a chart. Uh, it will be on the screen. The uh, left hand bar of the chart is in green. And that uh, is the guideline set by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, for eight hours of exposure in a workplace setting. That is 0 0.016 parts per million if an employee, according to NIOSH, is subject to levels of formaldehyde greater than that, NIOSH recommends the employee use a respirator. The next bar is a yellow one, and that is NIOSH's ceiling for 15 minutes of exposure. They recommend that workers only be exposed to formaldehyde at levels as high as 0.1 parts per million for no more than 15 minutes. EPA has identified uh, 0.1 parts per million as a level at which acute 
health effects can occur. The next two bars are standards set by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and if workers are exposed to formaldehyde levels of above 0.5 parts per million, exposure monitoring and medical surveillance is required. The same standards also provide that worker exposure be limited to 0.75 parts per million over an eight-hour period. These are the old standards. These were set when President Bush's fa uh, father was president. The next bar is an orange bar. It's EPA's acute exposure guideline level, which is designed to guide emergency responders in understanding the risks from a one-time exposure, such as might occur after a chemical spill. The EPA guidelines for formaldehyde states that a one-time exposure to formaldehyde at levels of 0.9 parts per million should not, should not lead to irreversible harm. And then we come to the last bar on the chart, and this bar represents the 1.2 parts per million level of formaldehyde that was monitored in the bedroom of the Sistrunks trailer on April 5, 2006. This level is 75 times higher than the level that NIOSH recommends uh, that workers know not be exposed to. And I have a statement I put in the record from the Sistrunks that uh, they reported all kinds of problems, including headaches, watering eyes, irritated throats. Their doctor told them their problem was due to formaldehyde. Well, do you think that the formaldehyde level that they were exposed to was safe? Mr. Chair, I am not an expert in formaldehyde, and I am not going to uh, attempt to even address that. I can tell you that we recognize that we have an issue. Uh, we know that we very clearly, the answer to this is to get people out of these mobile homes and out of these travel trailers as quickly as possible. Uh, we are... But let me tell we, you what FEMA said in response to this level of, of uh, formaldehyde. The FEMA and industry experts, th 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 this is, your agency said this, and I'm quoting, FEMA and industry experts have evaluated the small number of cases where odors of formaldehyde have been reported and we are confident that there is no ongoing risk, end quote. Mr. Paulison, how can you justify that statement that was put out by your agency? You tested only one occupied trailer, you found levels 75 times higher than safe, and then FEMA comes out and tells the public, we are confident there is no ongoing risk. FEMA's statement that there was no ongoing risk was false, a level of one point two parts per million is not safe. And this is 75 high, times higher than what NIOSH would say. Uh, there's only one reasonable way to respond to testing results th like this, and that's to take the issue seriously. Immediately conduct systematic testing of all these trailers to find out how widespread the problem was. And that's exactly what your field staff recommended. But they said the problem, they said the problem needs to be fixed today and that FEMA needs a proactive approach. Uh, they said there's an immediate need for testing. But you didn't do testing from FEMA. Why? We, we did do testing. We tested uh, new trailers that were locked up to see what the level was when we received the trailers and did, uh, once we ventilated those, did ventilation work to reduce the amount of formaldehyde? And the answer was yes. However, like I said in my statement, we're recognizing that in the summertime that's not going to be reasonable to do that. So we are taking this very seriously. We are doing the testing. We're starting in just a couple weeks to do some short-term testing. Uh, we want to take what the Sierra Club did, which, by the way, was a, a, a wake-up call for us when we received that report, that we have more, something more than just, a, just an individual isolated case. We recognize that we may have something uh, much larger than isolated cases. Well, Mr. So Paulson, we are going to expand, we're going to expand uh, what the Sierra Club did, doing much more scientific uh, Mr. Paulison, I'm going to interrupt you. You had a wake-up call. You must be a very hard sleeper because that wake-up call was over a year ago. And FEMA did no further testing. Uh, after you received this results, your attorneys put out a statement uh, through emails that implied that FEMA is going to own this issue if you do testing. What, what that, the that, 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 that shows a complete indifference to the welfare of the families living in these FEMA trailers because no testing was done and your lawyers said if you do testing, 
you may start owning the problem. What do you make of that? The attorneys are, are hired for a particular reason, and, uh, and they are there to protect from litigation. However, the department did not stop dealing with the formaldehyde issue regardless, regardless of what the attorney said. Uh, we were going. Did you we, test any other Occupy trailers? We did not test Occupy trailers. So you we, tested. We you, went along with the advice that we received from, from, EPA, from EPA. And, and your lawyers? And no, sir. And CDC, if I can finish my sentence, please. Uh, and CDC, that if we uh, ventilated the trailers, that would reduce the formaldehyde issue. My concern did is. Did you test to see whether it did reduce the formaldehyde levels? It did in our testing on the empty trailers. On the empty trailers where the fan was going, where the w w windows yep. were open, where the air conditioning was running 24 hours a day? Mr. What about where people were living? Mr. Chair, we were not formaldehyde experts. We were taking this as it went along, as this thing developed and got larger and larger. We recognize now that we have an issue. We are dealing with it in the best manner we can. The again, the alternative. The, 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 the EPA told you the following. The 14-day exposure maximum may be 0.03 parts per million, and the one-year level may top out at 0 0.008 parts per million. The levels we find after testing may well be more than 100 times higher than the base level. So if you're relying on EPA, they were telling you this was a problem as well. I'm telling you, we re you know, in hindsight, we could have moved faster. I'm telling you now, we recognize we have a problem. We recognize we have an issue. We're not even sure, we're not even sure if it's formaldehyde that's causing the problem. That's why I have asked CDC to test for not only formaldehyde, I want them to test for uh, airborne bacteria, I want to test for mold, I want to test for mildew, I want to look at the different trailer manufacturers. If your attorney would say, let me finish. I, we want to test for everything out there. I want to test the different trailer sites. I want to test the different manufacturers. I want to find out very clearly what the issue is and where the problem is and what we can do about it. Again, Mr. the answer is to get people out of the travel trailers. We, nobody, we have never had this type Mr. of history Paulson, before. Uh, where your staff a year and a half ago said you should be testing the occupied trailers. The testing didn't take place. Your lawyer sent an email saying if you test them you may take ownership of it. You said you didn't follow the advice of your lawyers. You said you followed what EPA had to say. EPA's statement is that the levels that they were uh, uh, seeing were too high for human health. Now there may be other problems. But you don't think even at this date that the formaldehyde levels were too high and might have endangered public health? Is that your, is that your testimony? No, so what I'm trying to tell you is we simply did not have had a grasp of the situation at the time. And as it went on, we are getting a better grasp of the situation. We're advising people what to do. We're telling them there's issues. Uh, I'm telling you where we're moving forward with this organization. Now, you can criticize me all we did for all what we did or didn't do. But I'm telling you, we understand there's an issue. I do care about the residents of these trailers. Do you uh, think my criticism is unfair? Part. Do you think my criticism is unfair? I think it is because we're looking at things in hindsight and not how they were at the time. Uh, we are now recognizing, as we have all along, that we do have an issue, and we w and we're going to deal with it. We Mr. are moving. Paulson, we're it, moving. Yeah, I know you're telling me what you're going to do, but your own staff said what you should have done a year and a half ago, that's not hindsight. It, you didn't have the foresight to listen to your own staff, but you did have the wrong judgment to listen to the bad advice of your lawyers. My time has expired, and I'm going to recognize Mr. Davis for his time to question you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Paulson, your testimony indicates there are approximately 200 known complaints about formaldehyde. Um, but um, data you've provided shows you have over 60,000 trailers still in use? Yes, sir. How many units did you actually deploy for Katrina and Rita? We had a, a little over 120,000 between Katrina and Rita. What is your trade-out policy? In other words, if someone were to complain, don't you still have trailers sitting there in Arkansas somewhere? We had, yes, sir. We do have a, um, a large trailer base in Arkansas. Uh, we, uh, if we have a formaldehyde complaint, 
uh, and we go out to the trailer and talk to the people and they're expressing those symptoms. We offer to exchange that trailer out uh, and we will do that. Uh, in some cases we've changed trailers out twice. We try to bring in a used trailer that has been uh, off gas for a long period of time. We clean it up and bring it and change that out. In some cases where it still has not worked, we have put people in apartments. One of the issues is about 80% of that 60,000 that are in travel trailers uh, are actually backed up in people's driveways while they're rebuilding their homes. Uh, those people do not want to move. Uh, the other 20% are people in a group sites. Uh, we are focusing on getting those people out of those group sites because they don't, there's not necessarily a plan in place that they have where they can move out. We know the answer is to get people out of these. Again, this was the largest emergency housing uh, effort the country has ever done. Uh, we have never had an opportunity to keep this, these numbers of people in travel trailers that we've used for 20 years uh, in situations like this. So this was something new for FEMA to deal with. But in, in hindsight, maybe we could have moved faster. Yeah, we're, I mean, moving, we're moving about six to 800 families a week out of travel trailers into apartments. The, but the, I mean, the, the, you heard the previous panel and the, the, the stories that they endured. Why didn't you just give them a new, new trailer? It's pretty clear they had a problem. These three, I don't know why, why they had the troubles they did, and we will look into that. It's you think in, in retrospect, after hearing the testimony, they should have just given them a new trailer? They, they, should, have, they should have been dealt with with much, much more respect from what I heard, uh, and I will find out why that happened. That's obviously a customer service issue. The philosophy of this organization is to treat people with respect and give them the, uh, the, the respect that they deserve and to take care of their needs as quickly yeah. as we can. Well, it sounds like some of the people on the ground understood that because they said we have a problem, they got the complaints, they filtered it up, but it, it sounds like that has not infiltrated into the general counsel's office. The general counsel does not set policy for this organization. Uh, they do give advice to us. They do deal with litigation issues. I set policy for the organization. But, uh, but you did follow their advice in terms of some of the documents that have been produced. They've stonewalled us, as Mr. Waxman noted, until the end. That comes out of the general counsel's office. I mean, I, I think they need some adult supervision over there because I think they've lost any customer service aspect to this. I think they're just hardline attorneys. We're really here trying to solve the same problem. And yes, um, we've done numerous hearings on where FEMA is. We'll have to do another one, I think, on what we're doing to prepare for next year. Um, and I understand the general counsel has a bent that they're trying to protect the agency and everything else. But they need to understand, in a case like this, you're, first of all, a customer service organization. So instead of saying we're going to delay this or we're going to cover this up or we're going to do they ought to be looking at ways to get the job done. And as I've looked at the documents and the emails, I think Mr. Waxman would agree that wasn't the direction they were going at all. That might not have been the direction the attorneys were going in, but that would definitely was not the direction that the uh, organization was heading. The organization was progressing down the road as this thing progressed to stay up with it, to find out what the problems were. We felt like we were dealing with it in the best manner that we could. Can you tell us why there wasn't a telephone number on the brochure that was given to trailer occupants? So if there was a formaldehyde problem or some other problem, they could call a central clearinghouse? Yes, sir. There, there are 27 different maintenance groups that, that take care of these trailers. Uh, it is posted in every trailer. Uh, we want the people to call that number and not a, a general number that would not be able to deal with their problem. Uh, it, it would not make sense to put a number on the brochure when the, tr the residents are, are, are uh, advised and told when they have a problem with the trailer to call that maintenance number, and that system works pretty well. All right, let, let me just get back to the general counsel's office a minute. I mean, th th this hearing wasn't on the calendar until mid last week. Uh, it was a direct response to FEMA's uh, production of documents made last Monday, July 9th. FEMA withheld documents citing attorney client privilege and the work product doctrine, but in the face of subpoena, the documents were produced. And as has been noted, they, they tell an unfavorable story. Uh, all of our staff tells us the documents were arguably not privileged. For these privileges to be recognized, and they're not applicable to Congress, by the way, you must carefully and methodically lay out a case. If you claim attorney-client privilege, you need to produce a privilege log. You need to produce redacted information. You need to write us a narrative articulating the potential harm to the United States if the privileged materials are disclosed. Your lawyers didn't do your lawyers didn't do any of this. No privilege log, no narrative articulating the harm, no redacted documents. 
that even didn't even put date numbers on the pages. Um, were you involved in any of the decision making about this legal strategy? No, sir. My philosophy is to run a very open uh, organization, uh, and I want to personally apologize to the committee for them not for you not getting the documents you wanted in a timely manner, nor in the method that you needed them. Uh, we have since turned over, I think, pretty much almost everything you've asked for, but you should have gotten it when you asked for it the first time. Yeah, let me just go through it again. The legal strategy with regard to the so-called privileged documents ended up really doing you in. Your lawyers complained about privilege, and then when it was time to show your cards, there was nothing there. You were just hiding all the smoking guns. Things might have been different if you'd come up with the materials to begin with. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Weissman? I think that's, uh, this should be a message to other agencies out there where we see some of the same things. By drawing so much attention to them, you essentially placed a gigantic spotlight in the worst possible place. Now, I guess our, the question this committee has to ask, and I'll, and I'll just say, is this a FEMA problem? Is this a DHS problem? Or do you think it's a government-wide problem? I don't know that I can answer that. I can tell you that uh, my philosophy is to, when a committee needs to do an investigation, to give you every document that we can legally give you in a timely manner. That did not happen in this case. And again, my personal apologies for that, and we'll work to make sure that does not happen again. Okay. Now, Mr. Paulson, you're neither a doctor nor a scientist nor is FEMA a medical or a scientific agency. Uh, how are you qualified to assess the health risks from formaldehyde or recommend strategies to address the issues? You're correct. I, I don't have that expertise. Uh, 30 years as a paramedic, but that doesn't give me a background in formaldehyde issues. Uh, we lean on the advice of our experts. That's why I am going to all of these different agencies, not just one. Uh, working with the ones that I laid out earlier with CDC, with EPA, with the HHS, with HUD, with everyone who deals with these types of issues to give us some very clear advice so we can make some sound decisions. Yes, we, in, in hindsight, we could have moved quicker than we did. However, uh, we do recognize we have a problem. I do recognize it's something we need to move very quickly on. That's what we're going to do. I want to find out what the extent of the problem is. Uh, but at the end of the day, I also want to be able to come up with something this country has never done and set some good solid standards down that we can, that we can use for future mobile homes and future travel trailers so we don't have this problem in, in the future. Now, your agency has been using travel trailers and mobile homes for as long as people can remember, haven't they? Yes, sir. Has this issue ever come up before on this scale? I, not, not, that I, not that I'm aware of. Anybody with any historic knowledge in the agency I, say, gee, I've this asked, happened? I, I've asked several people inside the agency, have we had this problem before? And nobody can remember of any. You know, we're going to go back and search our records to see. But uh, as far as anecdotal, uh, nobody that I've talked to recalls anything like this before. But also, we have not had this number of people in travel trailers for this amount of time. Uh, so these problems that are cropping up are, are obviously things we have to deal with, but it's not something we had any experience with. Do you think they were because of the number and the rapid production that maybe something was lost in, in, in that? Or, or where do you think that, it came you know, from? That I don't know, and that's what we need to find out. We need to find out why, why are we having an issue. Uh, is it the travel trailers? Is it the fact that they have flooding? I mean, again, we don't know what the real problem is. Uh, I mean, my gut feeling is, I can't go back gut feelings based on what happened with the secretary, but, but there is an issue inside the trailers, and not, but I don't know whether it's formaldehyde or mold or bacteria or whatever it is, and that's what the CDC is going to tell us. You're not and, positive, but it's point you're going to wait for the CDC to say if it's formaldehyde or from another source, and, but you're working with CDC to resolve it. Is yes, that? sir, but in the meantime, if people are having problems, we're going to be, be much more aggressive as far as trading these trailers out and, and trying to find we are working very hard to try to find housing for people. Uh, there simply is not enough housing in, in the state of Louisiana or Mississippi to move these people into. Uh, the ones that are backed up into their driveways rebuilding their house don't want to leave the state and go somewhere else. Uh, they want to be where their homes are, where their jobs are, uh, where their friends are, something they're familiar with. And we are trying desperately, uh, as, as apartments come back online, to move people out of those travel trailers into apartments, because we know that's the real answer. They should not be and these little tiny travel trailers this long. It's not a good place to live. We recognize that. But that was the only tool that FEMA had in its, in its quiver uh, to be able to, uh, to get people some decent housing on the ground very quickly. And that, that, that's where we are. And, and just finally, Mr. Chairman, we, we've seen a number of emails that, again, that just show the lawyers were reluctant to move forward on testing. Liability seemed to be their chief concern, not customer service. Any sophisticated organization needs to factor in liability concerns when responding to a crisis. I was a general counsel. I understand that. 
But at the end of the day, isn't it better from a liability standpoint, as Mr. Waxman knows, to be aggressive for the health and safety uh, of the people that uh, FEMA houses if it turns out to be a manufacturer problem or caused by some other external entity other than the U.S. government? Aren't we better positioned if we aggressively minimize the negative health effects? And I think that was your point, uh, Mr. Waxman. Yeah, the answer is obviously yes. I mean, it, we, you know, the easiest way to deal with litigation is to deal with the problem, and that's what we want to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Paulison, you said in hindsight you wish you would have gotten the materials to us earlier, even though your, your people were trying to hide behind an attorney-client privilege excuse not to give it to us, and you apologized to us for the delay. You also didn't get your testimony in 48 hours in advance. Uh, you got it in last night after 8 o'clock. You apologized to the committee. Do you think you owe an apology in hindsight to the people who have been suffering illnesses because of formaldehyde in their tra trailers that were not uh, tested by FEMA? So I don't know that that would resolve this, the answer. Um, I, I feel very, very badly for the people that are becoming sick. Uh, I don't know 100 percent for sure it is the trailers. I mean, very well may be. Um, we made the, what we felt were very prudent decisions along the way. Uh, could we have made different decisions in hindsight? Obviously, the answer is yes. Um, but again, it's a problem we've never dealt with before. It's a, an issue where we thought we were moving along with good advice. Um, you know, if we all look back on decisions we made and we had a chance to redo some of them, we, we would do that. Okay, thank you. Ms. Watson? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Polson. Thank you for your patience. Uh, in a direct response to one of our members who asked you about uh, your general counsel, you said the attorneys don't set policy, I set policy. So let me see where you would go uh, with setting the policy by addressing these questions. Would you agree that formaldehyde can be harmful to one's health? That's what medical experts tell me. I, I don't have personal knowledge of that, obviously. I don't have that type would, of training. Would you agree? Would you agree? Everything I, agree, I yes, read says no. that. No, everything that I read says that long time exposure to formaldehyde can cause medical problems. Would you agree? Yes, I said what I just said is what I agree to. That everything that I've read and everything that I've been told is a no, long No, just term answer my question. Do you agree? Yes, no. I stand on my answer I just gave you. Would you agree that formaldehyde can be harmful to one's health? Yes, no. I don't know the 100 percent answer to that, uh, Congresswoman. I'm, not, I'm being, trying to be very respectful. I'm saying that what I've been told is the answer is yes, a long-term exposure to formaldehyde could cause medical problems. Um, I can tell you, scientifically, it does. And all you have to do is go and be tested for formaldehyde exposure. And maybe that will make you a believer. So you're, you're not so sure yourself. That's what I'm getting out of your response, because I asked you for a yes or no, and you gave me a lot of other verbiage. So I will take that answer as not being sure. No, ma'am, I'm not really not, I'm not trying to say that. You know, you're asking me to give no, you a, I ask you, you're asking you, me to give you a medical you, opinion, and I'm not qualified to do that. I'm telling you what I'm being told, that long-term exposure to formaldehyde can cause medical problems. I heard what you but said you're earlier. But you're not sure. Okay. So if you say that long-term exposure, as I guess provided by someone else, would you then take your contaminated stock out of your um, inventory? The answer is yes. If we, if we have stock that we cannot re get rid of the formaldehyde in or reduce it to acceptable levels, and we should not be using it. Well, I can tell you this. It is a substance 
that is in the building materials. And if that substance is there, that is the cause of the health conditions of people who are living in there. I mean, it doesn't air out for years. As long as it's there, it's going to cause a problem to health. Knowing that, knowing that, would you then remove those trailers? Now, I understand there are millions of dollars in FEMA that has not gone to benefit uh, many of the victims. And so can you get rid of your stock that's in question and replace that stock that uh, has no formaldehyde in it? We, we are getting ready to do some very significant testing of the travel trailers that are, that are being occupied uh, under some very tough conditions, the ones that are being cooking in, smoking in, you know, all the types of things that cause formaldehyde. Let me just interrupt you from that explanation. If you find the presence of formaldehyde, would you take those trailers out of your inventory? If, yes, if we, find, if we find trailers that have unacceptable, formaldehyde is everywhere, you can't get rid of it. Uh, but if we find some unacceptable levels of formaldehyde that we cannot mitigate, we'll let, train let me, tra those trailers out. Let, let me, um, <laughs> that's the point I'm getting to. Let me restate my question. If you find there is formaldehyde in the building uh, parts of the trailers, would you take those trailers out, or are you looking for a certain level of formaldehyde? The, I think we would be looking for a certain level. I mean, there's probably formaldehyde in this room. Uh, there's formaldehyde in your clothes. My permanent press shirt has formaldehyde in it. We can't, it's everywhere. Our body produces formaldehyde from what my people tell us. Uh, Mr. So, Polson, so if you say Mr. There's, Polson, there's excuse any formaldehyde, me, my time's up. I'm sorry. So my time is up. And I'm going to uh, give it back to the chair. But I can just say that if you have humans inside of your trailers, I would think you would err on behalf of the human condition and take those trailers out of your inventory. You can test them later. But we do know that formaldehyde Almost any dosage has an impact on one's health. I would hope that you, as a policymaker, would see that your, all of your stock that might have trailers in it would be free of formaldehyde. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Uh, Mr. Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Administrator, thanks for your testimony and certainly um, while we have concerns about um, inadequate response of your agency uh, on this issue, uh, we appreciate your efforts uh, and uh, your staff at all levels in trying to do right by uh, their fellow citizens. Um, I, I do a couple of questions that are, I guess, follow-ups. One on the, on the health question that the uh, previous speaker addressed with you. Um, and I appreciate you're, you're not an expert in that based on what you've been informed that. Could you speak up? I, I, I wear hearing aids. I can hardly hear you, so <laughs> sorry. Yeah, uh, let me try to the speak of more into the direct. Uh, too many microphone. sirens and air horns, sorry. Um, you, in, uh, in response to the, uh, the general lady's questions regarding exposure to, um, from out of hide, you said based on what you've been told by experts and have read and been informed that long-term exposure uh, to from out of hide can be harmful to your health. That's correct. It could be harmful to your health, yes, sir. Uh, you're also, I, I think, been told that even short-term high exposure can be harmful to your health as well. Yes, sir. Um, and, and I think that's part of the issue here, and the testing has been done, and the chairman's different standards is that it's different levels for different level of exposure. Uh, how long you're exposed impacts how high or low that level is before it is of concern. And, and that's your, your understanding as well. I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? That I, I, I depending on how long you're exposed and what level will impact whether it's a health risk. Yeah, again, uh, that's my understanding. What, okay. Yeah. Um, given you, you've acknowledged that the testing conditions under which 
um, your agency move forward are now inadequate and unrealistic, especially for the summer months. I, is there at least an acknowledgement that that should have been understood up front, that it seems unrealistic the approach was taken, and that the testing, if it was going to be unoccupied charge, at least should have been under normal conditions that could have been expected? I think in hindsight, you know, you can always say yes. Uh, again, I think this agency made the best decisions it could with the information that it had. Looking in hindsight, should we have started uh, testing individual trailers, uh, you know, back in January or, or an earlier time, the, you know, working out the issues with the CDC, trying to define the problem? Uh, you know, you can always say yes. Um, it, now, uh, when those conditions were set for that testing, because you, um, by what's been shared with us, it seems very much the case that the general counsel's office was clearly what you stated about avoiding litigation. I would say about avoiding possible liability. And, and if I heard your statement right, you said attorneys are hired for a particular reason and to protect against litigation. Um, as an attorney, I don't believe that's why her, attorneys should be hired. Uh, they're hired to give counsel what the law is so that policymakers comply with the law, not to avoid litigation. And, and I didn't mean to narrowly define it. The, all, the, all the other issues you said are correct also, that it's all of those types of things. Give me good legal advice. But they also work to, just like any attorney does with a, the corporation, um, but they don't set, again, they don't set policy for me. They were not advised, they were not giving me direction not to do testing. We were making decisions we thought were prudent at the time. We did test trailers that were new to see, did they come from aldehyde? The answer was yes. And could we do something about it? At that time, the answer was yes. Uh, and but, but now, but now, okay, I, and I'm sorry, but I just, but now we know that we have to do something different than we've done in the past. And, you know, just like we're rebuilding this organization after I took over from Katrina, a lot of problems, a lot of cultural problems, uh, a lot of systemic problems, and we're in a process of fixing those. This is one of those things we've never dealt with before. Uh, we may not have dealt with it in the best manner we could have, uh, but now we're learning from that, and we're going to do that. Uh, I'm going to run out of time here, and, 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 and I appreciate this effort at rebuilding and getting it right. Uh, with your general counsel, uh, uh, one piece of advice I'd share is that if you have a liability at hand and, and there is litigation and, and yes, attorneys, it's better for all parties if you can settle it as opposed to going to court in a long drawn out uh, court uh, case. Um, but their, their duty is not to avoid litigation in any sense, in other words, liability, um, and that they be reminded what their, their duty is. But a specific question is regarding those testing conditions, was the general counsel's office consulted or you know, legal counsel consulted in any fashion in how the conditions were set um, regarding the uh, testing that was done? No, sir, not that I'm aware of at all. Uh, okay. we, wanted to do the, we wanted to do the right thing. We thought we were doing the right thing at the time. Uh, I want to get into quickly a, a specific case. Mr. Stewart, who, who testified earlier, clearly his case was mishandled by many within the agency, uh, including right down to when uh, supposedly, uh, based on his testimony, at least 15 FEMA personnel were on site, yet those 15 people couldn't see that they delivered a trailer that was wholly unacceptable. Uh, bugs in the bed, un, you know, the uh, septic system apparently not working. A as you go forward, I hope that you state in your testimony you're going to look at those three cases specifically and follow up with them. Is what happened that 15 or, or more FEMA personnel were on site and yet delivered an unacceptable trailer? Um, and what consequences occurred? In other words, was anyone reprimanded, disciplined any way for such failure of service? to someone in need. Uh, and and because I, I do appreciate that you're trying to get it right uh, and hindsight's a lot easier. But one of the aspects of, of hindsight is making sure that there are consequences for wrongful action. Not where there's good faith and something just went wrong, but when there's just failure of good diligence. And in that case, if, if you know the facts he shared are anywhere close to accurate, there was a, a significant failure of good service, and, and there should be a consequence for that. And, and I am going to look very carefully at all three of these cases on, from the customer service perspective uh, and to make sure that I need to find out was the statement accurate. And with 15 people, or I'm sure I can find out, and yeah. we will investigate that. Uh, 
we want to provide the best customer service we can. The philosophy of this organization that, that I put in place since I've been here is that the, the victim comes first above everything else that we do. And that's what we want to do. And if that has not happened in those, these particular three cases, there may be more, according to Mr. Uh, Congressman Jindal, who's doing a great job, by, by the way, down there, um, that, uh, that I need to, then it's, that's where I need to work on also, All right, thank along you. with getting ready for hurricane season. Thank you again for your testimony and, and your service. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, <clears throat> uh, Administrator, I've I got to tell you, I would feel a lot better if you agreed to do the following. Um, if you've got people, again, I want to go back to what one of the witnesses said. Um, he said there's a sense of helplessness and hopelessness. And what you, let me tell you what you need to do. You've got people who may not even know they're in trouble, that are living in these trailers right now. What I'd like for you to do, Mr. Administrator, is put the word out and say that if you suspect, if you're having vomiting, you're having all the things that it, to all these people who are in the trailers, let us know and we're going to address your problem. That's what I'd like to see you do. I will do that. All right. Good. Good. We're going to hold you to it. I will do that. Because I don't, I, I, I just really feel that there are people in jeopardy right now and, I, and you don't know how much better I feel about that because of the, uh, the next line of questioning. Um, the documents show that several occupants have died while living in FEMA trailers and that there were concerns that formaldehyde could have caused the deaths. Sadly, one of the occupants passed away just last week. Uh, on each occasion, FEMA was made aware that formaldehyde, formaldehyde may have been a factor. And on each occasion, nothing was apparently done. Mr. Paulson, please uh, turn to Exhibit M. This is an, an internal FEMA email from June 27, 2006. Um, I'm going to read it uh, for, so that uh, we all can hear it. It says, a FEMA applicant was found dead in his trailer at St. Tammany earlier today. We do, not have an, we do not have autopsy results yet, but he had apparently told his neighbor in the past that he was afraid to use his AC because he thought it would make the formaldehyde worse. It may not have, have anything to do with formaldehyde, but I agree with Mark that we need to deal with this head on, end of quote. On the following day, this issue was raised again if we turn to Exhibit N, and you can see in this email that FEMA was com uh, committing to testing the trailer in order to better understand the reason for the fatality. The email reads, and I quote, there was a death yesterday in a travel trailer in Slidell blamed on sensitivity uh, for uh, f formaldehyde. Radcliffe got together a conference call with CDC, FEMA, EPA, Housing and Safety. We will monitor the trail in question as soon as we get access to it. There were 28 officials from six agencies on the conference call. They recommended that FEMA take six actions. These actions included, included determining the cause of death, sampling the air in the trailer, requesting the Consumer Productions uh, Product Safety Commission to vet FEMA trailers against the industry standard, and identifying an independent non-governmental agency to conduct tests of indoor air quality and evaluate these policies. This is Exhibit O, page 3. Yeah. These were sensible recommendations. Do you know whether they were implemented, any of them? Uh, no, sir. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the conference call, and I don't know whether they were implemented or not. I okay. do know that the cause of death of a particular person and our Hearts really go out to the families for those. I know my father died from emphysema, so I know that uh, lung disease is very difficult. Um, it's up to the medical examiner and the physicians to tell us the cause of death. So we should not be even getting into that at all. I don't know if any of these things were implemented, but I will find out and right. I can report back to the committee on that. Well, the committee asked for every document that FEMA had about formaldehyde. We searched and searched for evidence that FEMA followed up on, on this death as the agencies have recommended, and we could find none. Instead, we found an email from FEMA, a FEMA lawyer that called the recommendations, quote, not acceptable and told FEMA not to do anything. It's very interesting. 
Again, I was not aware of this particular conference call, but I will follow up. I am so glad that Mr. Uh, Waxman scheduled the hearing, the witnesses, the way he did, because usually uh, people like you come first and then the other witnesses, the victims, come second. Um, but earlier you were here uh, to hear the testimony uh, and Mr. Cooper asked a very, stated a very interesting uh, question. Uh, he was talking about uh, a study that found 1.2 1, 1 uh, ppms of formaldehyde, I think it is, um, in a bunk area. Did you hear that question? Yes, sir, I did. And he said he wondered whether administrators or anybody would, want, would allow their child to sleep in such circumstances. Would you allow yours? That test, would, the answer is no, so I can give you a straight answer. All right. uh, that test was taken with a, uh, a closed up trailer uh, with the air conditioners off and uh, it probably was not conducive of what was really happening under, under actual living conditions. However, uh, the answer, if I give you an answer, the answer would be no. Thank you. Mr. Paulson, just last but not least, because you said something that is very, very important and I want to make sure the record is abundantly clear. You're going to put out a notice to all of these people who, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, who are in these travel trailers and letting them know of all of these things that people complain of that are natural, usually the things that people complain of with regard to formaldehyde, letting them know that there is a way that they can contact somebody to have this thing checked into so that we will not have victims sitting there helpless, hopeless and uninformed and the next thing you know, I know your lawyers, I'm a lawyer, they're worried about your liability and everything, but let me tell you something. At the rate we're going, if we've got tens of thousands of people sitting in these trailers, uh, we're going to have a problem. So you're committing to us today that you're going to put that word out and so that, and that when these people call, they will be calling somebody. Yes, sir. Thank I, you. I committed to do that and I will do that and I will give you a copy of the uh, notice that we send out. I th thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cummings. Ms. Norton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Paulson, I guess you say, my goodness, uh, what goes around comes around because you are now meeting me in the third committee in which I serve my own subcommittee, which has primary jurisdiction over FEMA, the Homeland Security Committee, which has jurisdiction for Homeland Security purposes, and the Oversight Committee, which always has oversight over government operations. Do you recall that when the formaldehyde, that the formaldehyde story first broke many weeks ago uh, when you came before me on another subject altogether? And at that time, uh, because it had literally just broken, I asked you about the formaldehyde and do you recall saying that uh, there was no danger and that you had been told that what people should do is open the windows? That's correct. Uh, where did you get that advice from, sir? We got that advice from the EPA and CDC that if we could air out the trailers that it would off-gas the formaldehyde, and that was the information we what had. What would they the say about that advice today? Uh, the, what we're saying now is given summertime in the Gulf Coast. It was summertime then. Uh, that, that that probably is not a practical solution. Uh, again, you know, we, we talked about this earlier. We made the best decisions we could with the information we had. This is something new for us. Well, you testified under oath that people should, should, should air out their windows. But let me take you back to uh, a year earlier in July where we now, as a result of, of papers obtained by this subcommittee, learned of a, of a memorandum that you yourself wrote to Secretary Chertoff uh, con concerning the status of current litigation. And I'm going to quote from that memorandum. FEMA's overall level of exposure for damages is low. Individual plaintiffs, in order to succeed, bear the burden of proof and must establish specific harm and damages based on the limited information known, known so far. This is likely to be a very high threshold for them to meet. Who advised you that they would, it's true that the burden is on whoever sues, but who advised you that the threshold would be so, uh, uh, difficult to meet a year before this matter came to the light of the Congress or the press? Uh, Congresswoman, I, I really don't recall, um, and uh, that's an honest answer. I, I don't recall who gave well, that advice. We have, we have a document uh, that says that uh, one month prior to this memorandum, 
uh, that a FEMA employee had stated that your own general counsel, and here I'm a, qu a quoting gain from your own internal d documents, has not wanted, general counsel, has not wanted FEMA to test to determine if formaldehyde levels are in fact unsafe. Um, and of course there's been other evidence produced in this hearing that uh, indicate that FEMA intentionally did not test trailers in order to avoid liability. Uh, How that, do you respond? That, that is not accurate. I w that, that's not my philosophy at all. We were making what we thought were good decisions at the time. Uh, we recognize now that we are going to, to go testing in real live conditions let with me just say with this the people living in those trailers. I, I've heard you say, Mr. Paulson, just let me advise you, you need um, to get other better lawyers. Let me advise you as a lawyer. You have increased your liability. It is, you're always in a tough situation uh, when in fact you may be sued. I'm not sitting here and say, to say you must incriminate yourself. What I am saying is that you must mitigate your liability and you must make sure that you are not indicating that there is no liability and you don't need to do anything. Now, I believe that you have increased your liability because I believe plaintiffs may be able to show you knew or should have known and therefore to have purposefully not mitigated uh, the situation for them may have put you in more hot water than you would otherwise have been. You need very good lawyers when you face this situation. Instead, you had people who were acting stupidly defensively. You must defend yourself. No one says the government must come forward and say, whatever you say is the case. The burden is on whoever sues. But particularly as a public official, the burden is on you to show that when you knew or should have known, you mitigated the, the, the problem by testing or doing whatever, whatever you had to do. You can test, as you know, under the law without that being held against you. When you begin to mitigate, the plaintiffs cannot say, therefore, you must be, be, be guilty. You um, also, we had a whole, you have testified here that the answer, and I'm here paraphrasing, is really to get rid of these trailers. Mr. Mr. Paulson, we had a hearing on getting rid of these trailers and we tried to do it the right way. We called before us and you at the same time uh, the dealers and we learned at that time that if you dump trailers, particularly since most of these dealers are in small towns where that's the, the, only, the only industry you, you could do it, you have so many trailers. Yet you testified here today, I think that you had 20,000 trailers still. If this is a question of old trailers, we, I have to ask you, what, is, what are you doing to offload the trailers to not have a situation like we had in Oklahoma where they couldn't get trailers even though they needed them from you uh, and to reduce this inventory of trailers uh, so that we are not faced with people living in formaldehyde uh, ridden trailers. When are we going to offload these trailers without dumping? What progress have you made in doing that? We are, the, with the comments that I made here was not not, not, a, not a related to getting rid of trailers, but moving people out of the trailers. When I said we're getting 400. Into brand new trailers? Pardon? Into brand new trailers? No, moving people out of trailers into apartments. That's what I meant when I was talking about here, about moving people out, getting rid of the trailers, getting them out of the trailers. When are you going to get rid of the inventory of trailers, which we now know, and some of which may have yeah. formaldehyde in them? All travel trailers have formaldehyde in them. And, uh, you know, we're ac accessing them through GSA. Uh, some of the residents who have those trailers, uh, uh, 20 some odd thousand have asked us if they can have those trailers. Um, uh, it's obvious that we're gonna have to at least post something in those trailers or let them know up front uh, that there, there's a potential for formaldehyde. You know, again, we are, we're learning a lot and, and your questions are right on target. We are learning a lot about travel trailers and mobile homes about they're not designed to stay in for the amount of time that people are in these things. They're meant to go camping in. And, but again, that was when FEMA made the decision to start using these, that's the only tool they had in the toolbox to get people housed in a very quick manner. Uh, and it seemed reasonable at the time. Um, and it works very well when you back out up in somebody's driveway, they're rebuilding a house. It does not work well with the group sites. Those should be mobile homes or something else. We are currently working with, expired. and I know I'm taking too much time, but I think this is an important issue. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. We are working with HUD uh, to find a, a better way to house people after a disaster. 
and it's not continually to put them in travel trailers. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Mr. Sarbanes. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's a lot of talk about the uh, lawyers and whether lawyers did the right thing or did the wrong thing, but there's a, I'm a lawyer too, I guess all lawyers are left here on the, uh, in the committee, but um, there's a period before the lawyers get into something, which is an opportunity to fix it, um, which just has to do with the way an agency or anybody reacts to a situation, to, to some kind of notice that there's a problem. And if you move with some kind of reasonable um, speed to address the issue, um, you can preempt things from going to the next stage. I mean, the way this, the way this seemed to work is you, you, miss the, you miss the initial response opportunity. Um, then you got into the stage where the lawyer's advice maybe became a, an influence over the agency's action. And then, of course, the last stage is always hearings in front of Congress, which you could have preempted if, if, you'd, if you'd done the first response um, properly. I'm still, like I think everybody on the committee, trying to get my head around how little testing has been done relative to the complaints and the information that seem to come forward. And um, I know you've probably been asked this question now a dozen times and answered it, but if you could just do it for me. Um, why, did, why did the agency not conduct more testing in response to the complaints that were coming forward? The, first of all, we do have a timeline of everything we've done from the time when the first, first time we recognized we had an issue with one trailer, which was in March of 06, and what we've done Every, almost every month since then trying to find out how big the problem is and what we're doing. So, and I'll, I can give this to you also. Uh, we did test trailers. We tested what we thought was the right thing to do. Uh, complaints, and that was taking trailers that were brand new, that had been locked up in the sun, testing for formaldehyde, and yes, they did have formaldehyde. And then what happens when you aired them out like we were advised to do by, by the uh, formaldehyde and, and uh, disease control experts, did it reduce the formaldehyde down to a low, low level? And the answer was yes, it did. So we felt like, and, and that was um, uh, very quickly, in fact, uh, we um, um, sent out a notice on... on um, let, me, let me jump in and ask this question. We sent out a notice the to all the, re all the residents uh, that uh, uh, very quickly, I see when it was, it was in July, which is just a few months after we had the first test, we sent a notice to every resident in those travel trailers uh, that there is potential formaldehyde and here's right. how you mitigate it. And we, at that time, we thought that was all we needed to do to resolve this issue. Um, you know, now we're going to go back and do some very significant testing. Sierra Club did some basic testing. Uh, we're going to expand that, go far beyond what they did. Uh, uh, the doctor that spoke here earlier, uh, the symptoms he was seeing, we've had CDC talk to him, get inf information from him, and we're taking all this information to make some good solid decisions. The science that we got earlier on the earlier panel suggested that um, the point at which you, you can smell the formaldehyde represents a, a, a level of elevation w well beyond what's acceptable with the with the statements being that there's, there's going to be a whole set of exposures below that level where you can actually smell it um, that are also harmful. So would you agree that the fact that you had what you are referring to as a relatively small number of complaints isn't necessarily relevant to how significant the problem could be and that the only, well, would you agree with that? The what I test said in my testimony was that regardless of whether we had two complaints or 200 complaints, which is what we have right now, 200 out of 120,000, uh, but that we, it doesn't matter. We're going to move on with some very significant testing. So just because we had a few doesn't mean we're not going to make, at that time we didn't think we had a big problem. We really didn't. We thought the off-gassing, ventilated, and that was the advice we were getting at the time. Again, in, in hindsight, I know you weren't here earlier, but in hindsight, uh, could we have made different decisions with what we know now? Yeah, the answer is, of course, is yes. 
Uh, but at the time, we thought we were making the right decisions uh, that protected the residents uh, and didn't cause an upheaval and upsetting people's lives again by trying to move them somewhere else. And I you know we would have moved to begin with. What was the administrative decision not to test? I mean, I understand we talked about sort of the, the influence of the lawyers on decisions not to test. But um, who decided early on that testing was not needed? We thought by, again, discussing with the, we're not experts in formaldehyde. I mean, we were, this is something brand new for us. We thought that by off-gassing, uh, by the advice we're getting to ventilate the, uh, the, the travel trailers and based on what we saw with the new travel trailers, that that was a good decision and that would take care of the formaldehyde problem. In fact, after that, the com complaints did drop off a little bit. However, recognizing that that doesn't, is not going to work in the middle of July uh, in, in summer in the Gulf Coast, uh, that we have to do something different, that we're not going to be able to uh, reduce those levels of formaldehyde. If it's the for, even formaldehyde that's causing the problem, we're just assuming it is. Uh, I've asked CDC to test for airborne bacteria, I've asked them to test for mold, I've asked them to test for mildew along with the formaldehyde to find out exactly what's causing the respiratory problems. Is it the trailer? Is it a certain manufacturer? Is it a certain style? Is it a certain park? Uh, you know, we don't have those answers yet, but I can have those in a very short time, and that's what we're going to do uh, to get some good, solid answers for these people living in these things. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. I'll yield back. I just all the answers that we're going to get are answers that the agency could have gotten earlier using just a minimum amount of diligence, in my view. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Jindal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the Chief. I've got several points I want to share. Chief, if I get, if we do another round of questions, I might give you time. I will give you time to respond to some of these things. But I've got several things I want to share. I hope my colleagues understand why for some of us in the Gulf Coast, for some in Louisiana, it's sometimes scary to hear somebody say they're from FEMA and here to help. And I don't say that as a personal attack. I just, I want to share with you my frustration. You know, we start off you talked about addressing these three cases, and I'm glad uh, I, Mr. Stewart actually communicated with me. He's got pictures uh, of the trailer that was brought. So you've got the testimony of the 15. He's actually got pictures to share. I want you to know those weren't isolated cases. My office took phone calls from constituents I described during the, the last round of testimony where they couldn't get help. They were told they needed medical documentation. They were told their medical symptoms weren't true. They were actually told by FEMA officials that this wasn't happening, what they knew was happening to them and to their families. And I won't repeat some of the heartbreaking cases. I will mention one. We had a constituent, literally only had one lung, decided it was safer to move back into a moldy residence than to stay in the FEMA-provided trailer, wasn't offered an alternative because of the formaldehyde. But I do want to make five other points. You know, CBS News actually did a report that they found an internal document where FEMA was warning their inspectors about the cancer risk, the potential cancer risk, by being exposed to, to fumes, to formaldehyde fumes. These are for the inspectors. What about the people that have to live there day in, day out? What about the people whose kids ha have to sleep in those trailers? The, the third thing I want to share our frustration with is, you know, back in April, uh, I'm sorry, back in August of 2006, FEMA indicated that they were going to do some testing. They were going to partner with EPA, the CDC. They, they told the committee this. But we find in the emails and the documents that were, were given to this committee in July in, in this month that the actual testing didn't happen until after the lawsuits were filed. It just appears from the emails that there was more of a concern with the publicity, with the lawsuits, rather than the health and the well-being of the people being housed in, in those trailers. The, the fourth thing I want to share with you in terms of frustration you know, we heard in the previous panel, it's obviously, and you've said, it's obviously better to get people out of trailers into permanent housing. That would be obviously the best solution. Louisiana applied for an alternative housing pilot program project. This Congress gave $400 million in June of 2006 for the so-called Katrina cottages. In December of 2006, the department uh, announced the grant recipients in Louisiana, Mississippi. Uh, you approved the Mississippi funding in April. As of July, 200 days since you've selected the awards, you still haven't approved funding for Louisiana's permanent housing project. So I agree with you. Permanent housing is certainly preferable. Here's something that can be done right away to at least begin helping hundreds of families. My fifth point is that, and this has been mentioned by our chairman and others, when you look at the testing, you know, a contractor working with the CDC said that the way the test protocols used by FEMA to test these trailers, doing them after they were completely ventilated, doing them uh, really appeared to be to skewed to yield 
atypical results. I am glad to hear that you are now open to doing the testing of the trailers in the way they were actually used. I wish that had happened months ago, but we have heard that the testing was actually it appeared to have been designed to allow the best test results to be achieved. It really brings me to my last point because I do want to also, and not, I just don't want to just share my frustration with you. I also want to point where do we go from here. And there are three things certainly I'd like the agency to do. Certainly I'm glad to hear that you are committed to doing more systematic testing to determine how large of a problem is this, how many people are potentially impacted. Secondly, I would hope that for anybody at risk, anybody that is living in one of these trailers that continues to have some risk to their health, an alternative housing arrangement will be arranged, whether it's permanent housing, whether, as you mentioned, apartments, whether it's a, a more suitable trailer. But third, for people that have been exposed, I hope they will be provided with the appropriate medical monitoring, medical services. We are talking about a carcinogen. In addition to the cases that have been mentioned with the Chairman's allowance, I would like to submit for the record some news reports in Baton Rouge. There was a case of a woman who has died uh, from cancer. They haven't determined conclusively that it was due to the formaldehyde, but she had actually sued. She had started a lawsuit thinking she had been exposed to the formaldehyde. She's now died from cancer. With the Chairman's uh, uh, permission, I would like to submit those news reports for the record. Without objection, we will receive them. And I, I do suspect my time is, is running out, but I, I hope you understand the level of our frustration. You, you may have heard me say in the earlier panel that it is almost like there were three disasters. There was the storm, there was the failure of the levees, and now there has been the government incompetence. And, and again, my, my point is not to yell at you, or, but my point is to say we have got to fix this, not only for Mr. Stewart, the other two witnesses, but for all those families. Let's give them better housing. Let's give them the health care they need to make sure we don't have anybody else suffering unnecessarily from asthma, from cancer, from respiratory illnesses. Uh, let's at least make sure going forward that we are not subjecting these people to these fumes after they have already been through so much. Now, Congressman, thank you. And I, I appreciate your comments. And I, I meant what I said earlier. I appreciate what your, your leadership down there. And I do want to work with your office. If, we're, if you're getting complaints that, uh, that FEMA is not providing that customer service that I want down there, uh, I would surely appreciate you sharing those with me personally. Uh, so I can deal. These three I am going to deal with. It sounds like to me that, according to what you are saying, that there may be others, and I want to get on, get on top of those and deal with them. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes himself for a second round. Uh, Mr. Paulson, I am pleased you want to respond when you get a complaint from a congressman. I am pleased you want to respond to three uh, witnesses today who came before the Congress. But I think you have got to respond to the American people why we are in the situation we are in. For those who are listening to this hearing or watching it, they think government, bureaucracy can't do anything right. I come from Los Angeles, and FEMA acted so well, so professionally when we, we had our earthquake. FEMA became a laughing stock when your predecessor, uh, uh, Michael Brown, was the head of it, and Katrina hit, because there was no competence in dealing with that terrible tragedy. But you are now the head of FEMA. You were confirmed by the Senate in April 2006. The problems with these FEMA trailers uh, occurred as of uh, around March 2006, when we first started hearing about it. So this is all on your watch. And on May 16, 2007, CBS aired an interview in which you stated you did not know that FEMA trailers were causing occupants to get sick. And we have a clip. I want to run that clip for you of this interview. Hill. There's we dozens of children getting sick, respiratory problems well, in those trailers that. right now. I, I don't know that that's We've been in Mississippi. I don't know. I've talked to those pediatricians down there who are seeing dozens of kids I don't with know respiratory that problems. I don't know that that's the cause. Uh, and if that's the case, that you know uh, that they're getting sick. I'm, I'm sorry that's happening. I don't know that the trailers are causing that. Yeah. Well, Mr. Paulson, we've reviewed nearly 5,000 pages of FEMA documents, and they're full of alarms about the level of formaldehyde in these FEMA trailers. And the staff, your staff, said there was an immediate need to take action. There was an independent testing done by the Sierra Club, and they found over 80 percent of the trailers had dangerous levels of formaldehyde. That was a year ago. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that you could not know as of May this year that there were no serious problems or that there were serious problems for families living in these trailers. It appears to me that FEMA did, deliberately did not want to know. No, Am sir, I wrong? That is not accurate at all, sir. The, the, first of all, the reporter ambushed me coming out of one of these hearings. Uh, 
And what he was talking about was the pediatrician that spoke here earlier and the, the, the uh, children that he was seeing with more uh, respiratory illnesses. Even with our doctors talking to him directly, he said that he did not know what he told our doctors from, the, from the Homeland Security, that if it was formaldehyde or, or was it uh, bacteria in the air or was it mold or mildew, he would just see more uh, respiratory problems. And that's the, that's the answer I gave to the reporter. I okay, don't know well, what's causing it. I'm not a medical doctor. That's what I was trying to get across. Okay. Well, I, I just think that uh, the public was appalled by the incompetence of FEMA after Hurricane Katrina. But when I look at your record, Regarding formaldehyde and FEMA trailers, I see the same indifference, lack of concern, and incompetence. I want to raise another issue with you. We have another clip. This was on May 15, 2007. You testified about uh, 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 before the Committee on Homeland Security. And could we uh, run that clip? Well, rather than run that clip, clip, I'll read it. We actually went out and investigated. We no. used EPA and some other agencies to do testing. Uh, we've been told that the formaldehyde it does not present a health hazard. Well, the, your statement was not based on an ambush. You were testifying. And your testimony was you weren't sure that formaldehyde does present a health hazard and you turn to EPA and others. And according to the documents, EPA told FEMA, and I quote, the levels we find after testing may well be more than 100 times higher than the health base level. You didn't do the testing, but after EPA, staff told, EPA told your staff that testing under real world conditions would expose problems, you changed the protocol. FEMA decided to test with the windows open, fans running, under unrealistic conditions. Uh, I can't understand why you changed the pro testing protocol uh, 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 about what was really happening to people. Can you give us an explanation of that? That test was done to see if we could reduce the level of formaldehyde in the trailers by opening them up and ventilating them out. It went along with the original test uh, that uh, where we tested a new trailers closed up in the sun, yes, they had a lot of formaldehyde. Could we do another test uh, with, the, with the advice we were given to ventilate the trailers and open them up and let them air out and off-gas the formaldehyde? That's, that's, so it was not a test to say, oh, yeah, we don't have formaldehyde. We knew we had formaldehyde. And to see, could we do that? And based on that test, we felt that we advised the residents, we sent notices out to all of the residents to air their trailers out if, they, if they're sensitive to formaldehyde, if it's causing a problem, open the windows, air it out, and off-gas that formaldehyde out of the trailer. Uh, again, you know, Congressman, I do appreciate this hearing. It's the right thing to do. I think we're going to come to some good answers at the end of the day. Uh, we made the best decisions we could at the time. In retrospect, there's no question in retrospect, we could have done things differently had we had the information we have now. Well, I guess I'm questioning whether you did make the best decisions with the I, information I understand you that. had. Because it seems to me you had red flags all over the place. But despite that, on May 17, 2006, the FEMA national spokesman made the following statement. FEMA and industry experts have evaluated the small number of cases where odors of formaldehyde have been reported, and we are confident that there is no ongoing risk. Why was FEMA confident that there was no risk? How could, you, how could FEMA make a statement like that in May? 2006 when you were hearing all these reports about people getting sick. And again, I don't know when the statement was made as far as... It was made in May in I mean, again, I don't know what the, what the relationship to that statement was, and I suspect it might have been made to the fact that we felt, uh, again, I'm surmising now, we might have felt that by ventilating the, uh, uh, the trailers and off-gassing the formaldehyde that then there was no risk to the trailers. I, I, I don't want to second-guess what somebody was saying. Uh, uh, or why they said it. So. Well, that's somebody who worked for you. I, I have, yes, and sir, I understand. spoke on behalf of your agency. I understand, yes, sir. Where does the responsibility for running your agency stop? It stops with me, sir. Yeah. Okay, I want to recognize any other members who want a second uh, round question. Ms. Norton. Uh, Mr. Paulson, I, I, I've got two questions I, I, I really must get in. One really goes to, to the good faith of the agency, even after your testimony today. Um, I want to ask you to look at this uh, 
exhibit, but we have an exhibit uh, of, from August 2006 uh, with a pamphlet on page 377 and 378, uh, which uh, was distributed to occupants of these trailers. We have combed this exhibit, exhibit U. We cannot find a telephone number for people to call. Uh, then <coughs> there's another exhibit that the committee attained, exhibit T. This is email from two FEMA employees, and this is the quotation, going to the good faith of what you've said here today, sir. I think you need to, 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 to indicate how this happened. This is a question, good faith question from an employee. I don't see a number on it. Are y'all going to put your numbers on it? We here in MS, I guess that's Mississippi, would put our call number on it. Or is the intent not to? In response, another FEMA employee says this in return. Hi, Sid. We're trying to not generate a lot of calls, just get the facts out. Now, you must explain, Mr. Paulson, how FEMA, I understand in earlier questions you talked about how people should be in touch with the companies. This is a FEMA document. How could you possibly have put out a document on trailers and apparently deliberately not give a contact number? Because the contact that they're supposed to make is where their maintenance group, and that number is posted inside the trailer. So why did not the document say? It, is, it should have. But the so res there was the no number of any kind the on the document, just the facts that you may be in danger. The, res the residents are told uh, they're given clear instructions with documentation. If there's any, any problem with the trailer, we have 27 different maintenance units across the Gulf Coast. If there's any problems with that trailer, that's what they're supposed to call. By putting the program office on, number on there, we just confuse things. And we couldn't do a, a different documents you for know every... What? You know what? Your, your employees didn't think so. They thought they should be a point of contact for you. You essentially were offloading, outsourcing uh, the rest of the deal. Look, you got a problem. It's between you and the contractor. But where did you get the trailer from? You got it from FEMA. And FEMA offloads responsibility altogether. They could have gotten a 1,000 different responses from, from uh, trailer uh, companies. Uh, the notion that you would outsource that responsibility after you yourself are responsible for getting the trailer for the resident creates a question of your good faith, particularly given what these employees were, were told. So I have to ask you. Uh, is there going to be a telephone number in FEMA that people can call with respect to problems with the trailer? The, the best place for them to deal with the, anything wrong with that trailer, including formaldehyde, is the maintenance contractors assigned to that particular service park. They're trained. They know well, what the Chairman, answers you, are. You, you hear the, it now, Mr. Chairman. The, the trailer comes from FEMA. The trailer comes directly from FEMA, not from the contractor. Not from but they're the, the ones dealer. that are they're the ones that we hired to and take so you're care of the that trailer. And so you people of every level, every education level, no background in trailers to negotiate their way out of the problem. Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to pay for it, Mr. Paulson? Who is in charge of paying for it if there is a problem with formaldehyde or anything else in the trailer? We are. I think that's the answer to the question, Mr. Paulson. If in fact you are the vendor, you got to pay for it. You cannot tell me that. The tenant has to therefore negotiate the deal with the trailer company. No, there's, well, there's no negotiation. That's the, that's the uh, opening, the portal into the maintenance for the Mr. trailer. Mr. Paulson, I have to ask you, are you willing now to give a FEMA number for people That is call? our representative. That is our FEMA number. If we start confusing the residents with different numbers, we Are have you willing to give a FEMA number if a resident in the trailer has a problem with a trailer that that resident got from you? Are, yes or no, are you willing to do we, that, sir? We have a number. and We put it inside the trailer for them to have right there at their hands. I, I don't know what else to tell you. You, uh, that, you are not willing to give a FEMA number. Have so a FEMA, that if the tenant has that a That is a FEMA number. That's who they go to for, uh, for, for maintenance for that number eight. Are you telling me that this is not still the case, that he said we don't want to give the number out? Now you do give a FEMA number out. What is that number, please? It, that number di is different for every park because we have 27 different maintenance groups. Is to take there a FEMA? Mr. Paulson, why can't I get an answer? Is there a FEMA that number? That is a FEMA number. 
That's the number that FEMA uses to, for the, the for the occupants to access the maintenance right, for that trailer. You're telling me that the, uh, the you, your, your your position still is that although you are you contracted for the trailer, the FEMA number is the number of the trailer company itself. Is that your answer? No, it's not the trailer company. We it hire we hire maintenance contractors to maintain those trailers. They make regular visits to the trailer parks. And they the, go the, through the, the trailers. Vendor is to, and the vendor is so they have to deal if, directly with the. If there's any problem with, with that trailer, they go to them, and we pay those contractors. They're basically our employees. I mean, that's who we use. We All train right. them. We give them instructions. I, I'm generally. sorry that none of I, I'm sorry that none of the people were here, so we could find out if this system works. I understand you're going to have uh, uh, a, a another hearing on food and ice. We on ice. We've had a hearing on food where millions of dollars in food were wasted and other food had to be given away. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Chairman, just recently there was exposed and one of the members of our subcommittee had a press conference on this yesterday because his area, Memphis, is where some of this ice was located, 22 locations where you stored ice. We told common knowledge ice has a one-year shelf life. Why did you not get rid of this ice within one year, Mr. Paulson? The, the ice that we had has been tested. $12.5 million in storage costs the, in the United this States. Is a, the ice is a commodity that has an expiration date. Uh, we kept it as long as we could, uh, and we made the decision to get rid of it. Uh, and the only way to get rid of it is let it to melt. So, so we are not, you, my question is, why did you, if you, if you, if, you know, Katrina has been over for a long time. So, so has the, 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 the following session. Uh, sorry, the following year when there might have been hurricanes, if you had gotten rid of the ice earlier, there would have been a mitigation of cost to the taxpayer. Is that not true? If we had gotten rid of it earlier, but we still felt the ice had a good head of life expectancy, we kept it as long as we could, then we made a decision to get rid of it. Uh, we are not going to store ice anymore. Uh, we've made a decision now to use outside uh, contractors. It's not a life-saving commodity. We don't need it today. You can wait till tomorrow to get it. Food and water is a life-saving commodity. We will still store those those things, but uh, the ice we will not. Gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Sarbanes, do you wish a second round? Real briefly, Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to ask any more questions about why you did or didn't do the things you did or didn't do because um, the answers are so implausible to me. Um, but I think I, I think I've got a I think I figured out maybe what was going on. The, the behavior of the agency uh, was irrational. If the agency was one that wanted to know what was going on, you can't. In other words, you can't square what you did with a desire to get to the bottom of the issue. It's it, it's. It's irrational behavior. Therefore, and, and human beings are fundamentally, when they have, you know, when they have possession of all their faculties, human beings act in a rational way. So I'm trying to figure out um, what would make the behavior rational. And the only thing that makes the behavior of the agency and its leadership rational would be if you didn't want to know and you didn't want to take responsibility. That would explain why you wouldn't do testing that was obviously called for. That would explain why when you did do the testing, you would do it under these highly contrived conditions in order to try to get to a result that would be favorable. That would explain why when you did the testing, you did it on trailers that were not occupied because if you found a bad result, you could then, in a very legalistic way, distinguish it from those who were occupying the trailers because you could say, well, the fact that these trailers that are unoccupied have dangerous levels doesn't mean that the trailers that are occupied have dangerous levels. So every step of the way, it was calculated to not know or not take responsibility. And I've reached that conclusion because you strike me as a rational person, and the only way to explain your behavior in a rational way is to conclude that you didn't want to know and you didn't want to take responsibility. No further questions. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a, a few final questions, if I'm one of the last people to ask. I want to make sure that this problem doesn't spread. I mean, you certainly 
hear the combination of frustration, exasperation, and disbelief from members of this panel. But I want to talk about where these trailers are moving from here. Uh, I understand that a lot of these trailers, uh, as uh, people no longer need them, uh, in the Gulf region are moving to other places. Um, and I want to ask just a simple question, what procedures you're putting in place to make sure that none of the trailers that have any formaldehyde contamination or have any reasonable belief of formaldehyde uh, contamination are reaching uh, other parts of this country uh, and other buyers uh, who are looking for those trailers? Well, we are selling the trailers. We're accessing them through GSA. Um, what we're, based on what we know now, what we're going to have to do is make sure those buyers understand that these are meant for camping and not for long-term living, that they do have formaldehyde in them, and here's the, here's the system for that. So we're going to have to do that with every trailer we sell uh, to get rid of them. Other than that, we would just take them and crush them and put them in a dump dumpster somewhere, and I don't think that's fiscally responsible, uh, considering that every travel trailer is built basically the same. Uh, so people either buy them from a travel agency or buy them used from us. In fact, the used ones would have less formaldehyde than a brand new one. So, uh, so we, we do excess, uh, excess them through, uh, uh, through GSA to get rid of them. Uh, we've had, uh, I think, over 20,000 people who, who have those travel trailers now want to keep them uh, once, they, once they're, they moved out of them. Um, so, and I don't know what we're going to do with that yet, uh, they, but they have asked in a notification, they have asked for those. But they want to keep it for camping trailers, not to live in, obviously. And, and I don't know what the answer to this is. I don't know when you cut your losses uh, here. Mm -hmm. I understand the need to, to always be mindful of fiscal responsibility. But to the extent there is any level of formaldehyde that even in the short term or the long term, because this is probably not going to be the last owner of the trailers. They're going to be transferred again and again and again. And to, and, to, and to somehow rely on the fact that that information is going to be disclosed as they get transferred it seems like a pretty dangerous policy when we have our hands on them right, right now. I mean, just as a for instance, Mr. Paulson, this committee I know uh, contacted the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department where some of these trailers were transferred to. They tested them once they got them and found levels of formaldehyde above the uh, 0.1 uh, parts per million. So we already know people have them that, uh, uh, that have tested them themselves and found levels that they consider to be excessively high. Uh, so, I, I mean, I would just ask you to really reconsider that point as to whether disclosure is going to be the best policy going forward. We may have to cut our losses here on trailers that have been contaminated and known to have harmed yeah. people uh, already. You know, and, and again, as, as we learn more and more about these things, that's definitely a public policy discussion we have to have uh, with what we're going to do with them. I, I, th I think your comments are right on target. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Murphy. Uh, Mr. Paulson. Um, as I said to you before we even started this hearing, our job is to um, find out what happened and make sure it doesn't happen again. We're trying to be constructive, but I think we all have to be responsible. Our job is to do responsible oversight, and I hope you'll look to see whether your agency has handled all of this in a responsible manner. Thank you very much for being here. Today. Thank you, sir. And I do, again, I meant what I said earlier. I appreciate you doing the, the hearing. I think of a lot of good things going to come out of it at the end of the day. Thank, Thank you. you uh, that concludes our business at this hearing. We stand adjourned. But we do have a business meeting, and I'd like to ask the members if they would to stay for the, at least the business meeting. Uh, I don't think anything controversial, is that right? Right, and you can go ahead and be more thought, Davis. Okay. Bruce Albert is a congressional correspondent for the New Orleans Times-Picky.